I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. I've gone stateside to check out the city bakes in one of the world's most iconic places. One that never stands still. I'm in New York, in case you haven't already guessed. I'm in the middle of Times Square. It's sunset. This place is buzzing 24 hours a day. But I'm here to check out the bakes. What's the next trend that's going to leave New York and come to Europe? I'm here to find out. I'm going to dive into the latest flavors of the New York donut. Oh, yeah. Wow. I visit a bakery that has turned the rustic bagel into a performance. Hot bagels! Hot bagels! And after near death by cheesecake, I come up with my own bit of New York cheesecake magic. I think we're on something. This is a city that instantly makes you feel you're in a movie. Everywhere you look screams New York. One of the things about New York is its size. I mean, I know London's big and it's got the odd occasional skyscraper, but New York has got more than its first year. Wherever you go, you feel dwarfed by these colossal buildings, not more so than Empire State. It's a nice day, and I think I've got to head this way. As you might expect, Eating in New York is a pleasure, and in fact, it's an adventure. Even something simple like a bagel for breakfast is a hard decision. Good morning. Hello. How's it going? I'm good. Um, what can I help you with? What are the options for the bagels, then? Uh, well, we have a whole bunch of different bagel options. We have the everything bagel and, of course, the whole wheat everything bagel. Um, we also have the multi-grain bagel, or if you'd like, we have the health grain bagel. This is what New York is famous for. Thank, Thank you very much, Adi. Doing everything bigger and better, even its bakes. I like to think that I'm on the cutting edge of baking. I like to think that I invent different things. But to be honest, for me, New York is going to be fascinating. And I'm sure we're going to get a little bit of inspiration while I'm here. I'm going to finish my bagel. It's delish. The coffee is not bad either. I'm starting my search for the best of New York with that American classic, the donut. The United States has long had a deep love affair with them. But I'm told that this shop, open for less than a year, is trying to do something new. Donuts. These are great looking donuts. Thank you. They're, they're, not, fattening all, they? no. they're not fattening at all, are they? No. They're not fattening at all. I can no, eat no. loads of them. It's not going to yes. put any weight on me. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm used to a little bit of sugar on mine, but the choice here is incredible. Lemon and poppy, chocolate, cafe au lait. Right, I think I know what I want. The toffee, okay. the kimchi. I've got to try the basic one as well, so a yes. plain one, please. And the passion fruit, please. OK, that's my favorite, actually. Is that your favorite? Yes. Do you think that's enough to start with? Well, just to start, but <laughs> I think you have to try the hibiscus. Yes, I've never had anything like that, I must admit. And this is candied hibiscus flower. I'm wow, telling. that is an impressive array of donuts. Fanny is the shop owner, and the bakery is right behind the counter. They make donuts all day long here, so they're fresh for the customer, which I'm happy to say is me today. You've taken the humble donut and turned it to something very, very different. Mm -hmm. Now, this one is? Dulce de leche with toasted almonds. Oh. Dulce de leche is a South American flavor. It's basically the toffee in banoffee pie. <laughs> it's very Moorish. <laughs> That's delicious. Now, this one is? Passion fruit. I'm from Mexico, so I didn't grow up with sweets that were extremely sweet, so I crave sour, tangy flavors. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's a strong hit, the yeah. passion fruit. Oh, yeah, I love that. I'm surprised you haven't made a tequila one yet, then. We, we, we do. We make, <laughs> you do. Uh, we, you do. We make a margarita one. <laughs> do you? Yes, for you know, Cinco de Mayo, mojitos. So what is this one? This is the hibiscus. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> That's delicious. Thank you. I love that. It's not a strong flavour. It's a hint at the back, but it looks so attractive. Although the flavours in the donuts are different, they're out there. They don't taste artificial. They taste full of flavour. I mean, I didn't realise that donuts could be taken to such a level because a lot of the flavours you have here I've never heard of. I'm fascinated to see how Fanny's Donut Bakery churns out so many flavours all day long. The heart of the operation, then? Yes, yes, it is. Fanny's baking team stamped the dough out by hand. You know, it's a brioche-type dough. Yeah. With a little less uh, butter, it's not as rich. Yeah. But we use fresh nutmeg. And after proving, it's deep-fried before getting its flavoured glaze and toppings. What is it about New Yorkers that allows you, in particular, to be able to open a shop like this? New Yorkers are foodies, and you have such a melting pot of cultures, you know, and I am one of those, and so is everybody else. So you're always surrounded by inspiration. You go see things, you go try things. So what you're actually doing is your culture, your heritage, your flavors that you have in your mind, what you grew up with, you're bringing to the people of New York yes. in the form of a donut. Exactly. <laughs> That's what makes a difference. Exactly. I love it. I really Really do. If this is what New York can do to a donut, I can't wait to see what else awaits me. Much of the baking in New York originated in Europe. Family recipes brought over through the 18th and 19th century by waves of immigrants. I've never actually seen the Statue of Liberty before. I mean, it looks small in the distance, but she's a whopper. But this was actually the route in that most of the immigrants took coming into America. It's incredible beautiful morning to come and see it. One of the bakes that came in with the Jewish immigrants were the famous bagels. I want to take you to a place called Saddles. Now, it's run by a girl called Melissa. It's only been open nearly a year. Now, she's turned bagels into an entertainment form. Really? I'm the only one that can do that. Hello. Hey, how are you? Do you mind if I take these guys in to have a look around? No, please, come right in. Thank you very much indeed. Now, this place is very special. This is a very different bakery to the street bakery where I bought my breakfast this morning. It's a bit posh. The waiters are all dressed up with dicky bows. The centre is where Melissa makes all the bagels. And all around is the entertainment seat. This is the theatre seat, if you like. And when fresh bagels are baked, they're announced. And all the staff join in, just like a chorus line. I want to introduce you to Melissa, who started all this. And she's over there making bagels. Come with me. Hello, Melissa. Hi, Paul. Nice to see you. Hello. Nice How to you see doing? you, too. So this is your home? This is my home. My son jokes that it's the bagel jail. <laughs> I like that. Melissa's sourdough bagels are prepared in a nearby kitchen. Thanks, Alex. Too easy. Like all bagels, they are boiled for a few minutes, then some are tossed in seeds. And then we put them on these boards, and these boards then go into the oven. So we put them in the oven upside down. After a few minutes in the rotating oven, the bagels are flipped over. Uh, so you bake them on one side, flip them over onto the And then they finish baking. Slate. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. The British afternoon tea is served on a cake stand. You've taken the scone, or the biscuit they call it, yes. out and put the bagel in. We have. We love the elegant presentation, and we wanted to elevate it so that it wasn't considered your local deli bagel that you can get on any street corner. I think it's a great idea. It's fun. The whole point of this is a celebration of the bagel, celebrating that yeasted little bun that came over to New York and it's just gone boom, and this is taking it to a whole new level. So when are the next lot due to come out? Momentarily. Are they? I know you all know me as a shy, retiring baker, but when in New York, be loud. Hot bagels! Hot bagels! Thank you. You could have shouted with a little bit more gusto the next time. Well, that was quite rowdy. I think that worked. He, he made the great. One of the great things about New York is Obviously, you've got these huge buildings everywhere, just go vertical. And then right in the heart of New York, you have this, Central Park. Central Park is vast. It runs from Midtown right up to Harlem. And any time of year, it's beautiful. Most people that live in New York come to this place as 
It's a little bit of a respite. I suppose the equivalent would be Hyde Park in the UK and London. Whether you fancy a horse and carriage ride, rollerblade, jog, or a spot of rowing, it's all here. And one thing which is pretty poignant to me, coming from the northwest of England, there's a memorial over there to a guy I'm a big fan of, John Lennon. I was born and raised on the Beatles. My mum and dad were both big fans. My mum saw him in the cavern many, many, many times. And she actually didn't think they were much cop, which is strange. And I made up the call this place Strawberry Fields after him. It's a nice memorial, you know. Still to come, I discover a new way of baking bread that is so easy, I can hardly believe it works. That looks like a true artisan bread. And I bake my own tribute to the inventiveness of New York by putting its cheesecake inside my chocolate brownie. Get in. I'm in New York, exploring the inventiveness of this incredible city. My next bakery is in Hell's Kitchen on the east of Manhattan. Sullivan Street Bakery is so renowned that even the New York Fire Department stop by for their lunch. This is a bit of a personal fact-finding mission for me, because Jim Leahy is famous in the bread world for coming up with a brand new, super simple way of making bread at home. Hello. It's so nice to see you, man. Welcome, welcome to the shop. Great looking things. It's You're nice. known because you changed the way that we Mix bread. You mean you're talking about the no need? That's the one. Method. Can you show me and yeah, explain well, what this whole thing's all about? Yeah, I'll, yes. I'll gladly show you. You want to come back yes, into the bakery absolutely. and we'll give you a, a quick tour? I've always made bread at home by giving the dough a good long knead. You That's know. beautiful. Yeah. But Jim has apparently come up with a method that does away with all that elbow grease, and I want to know how it works. This is the technique now yeah. that you came up with. So the no-knead process is a really, really simple principle. 400 grams of flour, you add yeast, and that's about a half a gram, and this is eight grams of salt. Okay. Fine table salt, sea salt, yeah. and then I'm just gonna mix it together. This method, hands down, produces better bread than even the best artisan baker's attempts. And what's really beautiful about it, Paul, is that it requires no effort on your part, my part, or your viewers' parts. This sounds too good to be true. I've weighed out for you 300 grams of water. Let's get really detailed then. Hard water or soft water? Tap water. Okay. Just tap, regular tap water. Pour it in, and then I'm just gonna pull it together like this, and it is done. And that is shaggy. And that was about like six seconds or yeah, so? Yeah, about six yeah. seconds. Normally, I'd be working this dough for maybe 10 minutes until it's smooth and elastic. It's a very different method, because obviously you're not working there, you're just leaving it alone. But this is all Jim does. Perfect. It gets covered and left alone. After 24 hours, this is what it would look like. So it goes from that to this. The dough has risen ever so slowly, and despite not being kneaded, it's now smooth. What is really weird is, during my baking life, I've done doughs like that before inadvertently just mix something together and forgot about it, come back and it's blown up. What I haven't done, though, was go to the point of baking it. I respect the integrity of the blob. You don't want to cut it into a bunch of little pieces. You want one whole piece, mm -hmm. OK? Jim is what I would call a breadhead. I love his energy. Anyone can do this, and that's it. Done. That really does take just seconds. To bake it, Jim has a whole new technique using preheated casserole pots, or Dutch ovens, as they're known in America. Then we have our doughs that have been sitting here for a little over two hours. A little bit too big for the pot, but we're going to make it work anyway. A little lopsided, not ideal. It's the principal kiddo. And we're going to put this in the oven now for about 20 minutes. Personally, I've never baked in a Dutch oven before, so this is going to be fascinating to see what they come out like. So they baked for 20 minutes with the lid closed, about 15 minutes with the lid open. You can pick one up now. They're, they're still hot, but you can probably handle them quickly. The light. Yes. So I'm going to try to cut this in a way. It Medium. smells fantastic, yeah. But look at that structure. That looks like, you're right, a true artisan bread from the middle of France or you know the middle what? of Italy. I, I love the way you got structure. 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 <laughs> However I say it, this is a really impressive loaf. Tastes like, think of the best homemade loaf you've ever made that your grandma used to make. 
Now that, that's where it is. That's a huge compliment. The grandmother thing. I mean, I like the, I, it makes me kind of get like <laughs> all teary eyed. Do you want a tissue? I do. I think in Europe, as bakers, we're restrained by tradition, by rules. And I think in New York, that doesn't exist. I think they've mastered the recipes that have come over from Europe. I think he's changed it, made something completely different. That's why it had to come from New York. Thanks, Jim. Oh, Paul, pleasure, pleasure, man. Pleasure, mate. Look after yourself, all right? Yes. What I'm slowly discovering about New York is the quality of bacon is here. They've got some fantastic recipes, and what they've done with those recipes is step them up a notch. I think it's revolutionary, and that's the key thing. That is the New York way, bigger and better. Before I leave this city, I'm on my way to visit a New York institution. I want to welcome you to Brooklyn. I want to welcome you to Juniors. I'm told you don't know cheesecake until you've been to Juniors. This New York family has been reinventing it for the last 65 years. Alan Rosen is the third generation to make this recipe. For 65 years, we've been on this very street corner making the recipe exactly the same way as when we started. It is incredible, and even the signposts on the road here. Yeah, well, we were fortunate enough they renamed the street corner Harry Rosenway Cheesecake Corner. Harry Rosen was Alan's grandfather, who created this recipe in 1950. Now, I've come all the way from the UK to look at your cheesecake. Generations of Brooklynites have come to eat at Junior's Diner, and on the floor above in the original 1950s kitchens, thousands of cheesecakes are still being made by hand. And unusually, Every Junior's cheesecake has a sponge base. I've got to try some. Hello. How are you? I'm good. This is Paul. We're going to introduce him to a little New York style cheesecake today. OK. We're going to start with uh, our, our classic, what started us off, the original, the New York style plane. I've got to try this. That is the one that my grandfather started with 65 years ago. I like. Good. I like it a lot. It's very, very creamy. Um, you can taste the, the cheese in it. The, the sponge is beautiful and soft. That is gorgeous. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed. I can't finish it all, though. You might want to keep your fork. Oh, we right. got some more coming. OK. Can we have a slice of strawberry, please, Marcel? Sure. When Alan said he had some more coming up... Strawberry cheese pie. He wasn't joking. Fresh strawberries. That. It's delicious. That's a standard filling, yeah? Same, exactly the same. OK, bring it on. Whatever you have, Marcin. Wow. What's happened is, over the last 65 years, juniors have elaborated on their original recipe, creating more and more incredible cheesecakes. I like the pineapple. Cheers. <laughs> so I'm sitting with my dad over breakfast 20 years ago. Yeah. And my dad says, why don't you take a plain cheesecake and put it inside of a chocolate layer cake? Do you know what? It shouldn't work, but it does. It does. It does in so many ways. And then yeah. from that, we came up with red velvet cheesecake. OK. Dear me. That's quite light, actually. That's well, after you've had that one, this one's It is. Light. I love the colour on that as well. How about we'll lighten you up with a little fruit now? How about an apple crumb? It's difficult to explain, but the flavours are excellent. The strawberry one I particularly like, I'm going back to the plain one. OK. Apple crumb cheesecake. So we took two of America's most beloved desserts, <laughs> apple pie, basically, and cheesecake. That's a great blend, that one. If I hadn't eaten any of those, I could probably clean off one of those. Oh, I could, too. I, you haven't got any more, have you? Yeah, we do. We got a few more. <laughs> of course he does. Alan also has Black Forest cheesecake. Oh, wow. And carrot cake cheesecake. Does it get any bigger than that? That's the biggest one we have. <laughs> A lot of people... Whoa, oh, one's, one's, one's gone. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that one later. You're doing great, I got to tell you. Thanks very much. Chocolate mousse and raspberry swirl at the same time. <sighs> Thank goodness these are the last two. You, is that a seriously? Is that a portion? Yes, regular size portion. We didn't do anything special for you here today. No offense. No joking. All these cheesecakes taste amazing. I promise you they do. I'm pretty full after my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelfth spoonful of cheesecake. If the New Yorkers can innovate like this, so can I. Before I leave Juniors, I ask Alan if I can invent my own Hollywood cheesecake. You'll be the only guy except for 
our bakers who get to work upstairs in that bakery. So that's going to be amazing. I hear you're a big deal back in the UK, so we're going to let you let you up there. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. I just need to sit here a minute first. Uh, rest. I've decided to take my own chocolate brownie recipe and somehow get Junior's cheesecake inside it. So you're going to crack on with your cheesecake. I'll crack on with my chocolate brownie, and we'll try and have a bit of a mix. My, my pleasure, a mashup, so to speak. Have a mashup, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alan's recipe, unchanged for 65 years, is Philadelphia cream cheese, which he's going to slowly blend with sugar, two eggs, double cream and vanilla extract. My brownie starts with whisking together six eggs with sugar. Well, I'm doing mine by hand, you see. You're, you're cheating slightly because you're using a mixer. <laughs> Into the eggs, I pour a lukewarm mixture of dark chocolate and melted butter. Straight in. You can see how slack that is, see? Perfect. Next, self-raising flour. The last thing I'm going to add Pieces of chocolate. Have you done anything like this before? Brownie with a, no, with a cheesecake? I mean, maybe next week. Call the Hollywood cheesecake. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he thinks that's funny, but I think it's going to be a winner. I think it's ready. All yours, my friend. Oh, beautiful. This should be quite delicious, actually. Looks pretty interesting. I'll have one more there. I don't want it to change colour too much. I want it to be quite stark, so you see the cheesecake and the brownie together. We bake it at 170 degrees C in Junior's original ovens. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you very much. That's a great looking oven. Yeah. The cheesecake and the brownie both bake at the same rate and stay separated. Wow. Giving the brownie an incredible looking cheesecake marbling running right through it. I've never had anything like this before. I'm looking forward to it. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Delicious. Really wonderful. It's a lovely blend. You've yeah. still got that brownie texture as well. Yep. You've got soft chocolate. And the brownie's all across the bottom, and the cheesecake's on its own. Mm, all right, all right. This is good. I want something. This is my little innovative nod to New York and its history of incredible bakers. I like New York. It's given me back something which I think I was beginning to lose. New York has given me the passion, basically, to go back home and try lots of different things and not be restricted by the tradition of a recipe. Change it. Why not? That's what New York does, and it works. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Billy's. In search of the people, <laughs> the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. This time on City Bakes, I've come to the capital of French baking, Paris. This is something else, this is another level. I discover the artistry of the Parisian patisseries. The finest jewelry shop you've ever been into meets the Louvre, meets a bakery. I sample the very best boulangeries in town. Oh, oh. oh superb. And I create a towering City Bake that you can make at home. I'm quite happy with that. My quest to find the best of world baking has brought me to the city that sets the standard for all bakers. When they do a bakery in Paris, they don't just do a normal bakery. You go in and get a, a donut filled with cream or a custard slice. Oh, no. Everything is like a work of art. Everything is a chef's creation, often unique. I've developed a huge respect for the recipes, the flavors, and the traditions of French baking. Your basic bakery, you wouldn't find that in the UK. Not as elaborate as that, anyway. It's so Paris. Believe it or not, this is my first visit to Paris, 
a place that has inspired my love of baking. There's so much to take in, and I don't just mean the incredible bakes. Look at the decoration, look at the decor around the top, the painting, the architecture. Look at this, chandelier in the middle of a bakery, that's ridiculous. I grew up a world away from this, but I've always admired the style and the elegance of the French. This, for a baker, is like the holy grail. I think it's absolutely stunning. I'd love to have a shop like this. Probably missing a sausage roll, though, if I'm honest. There's so much more to Paris than its baking heritage, of course. And long before I was tucking into a French croissant or baguette, it was a local landmark that captured my imagination as a child. Lovely, isn't it? Such a beautiful building. Reminds me of when I was six, and I got Meccano for Christmas. The Eiffel Tower has stood over Paris for over 120 years, and the little boy in me can't wait to pay a visit. But the view from the top isn't quite what I'd imagined. OK, so the weather's not the best today, but it still feels pretty good to be up here. This is the home of bacon, and I can't see anything because the clouds have descended. But who cares? Hollywood has come to Paris. The view across the city might be a bit limited, but all around me, the Parisians' love of baking is clear to see. Just walking up the street, I've seen three bakeries already. There are over a 1,000 bakeries in the centre of Paris alone. The secret is looking for the best one. If you're a decent baker in France, you have an artisan boulanger above the door. And believe me, if you live in Paris next door to a bakery like that, you'll shop there every day. Twice a day, go and get your baguettes. Twice a day, go and get your pastries. And maybe a pudding or cake as well. This is about pure neighborhood baking. And I'm heading to a bakery that's considered to be the best in the neighborhood of Montmartre. It's Café Raphael run by artisan baker Sebastian Hayertz. Enchanté, Sebastian. Parlez-vous uh, anglais? Yes, I do. Super. Sebastian won second place in a prestigious Paris-wide competition to find the best baguette in the city. Is there a certain template that you use, or is it rules that you have to follow? There is, there is at least five rules to oh, get, a, to get a, a good baguette. Okay. It's the color, the, yeah. te the texture, and the taste, and the smell. Yeah. And uh, when you push, on the, on the paste, when it's cooked, it comes back. It springs back. Yeah. Wow. Sebastian bakes 400 baguettes a day, and customers visit his award-winning boulangerie from dawn till dusk. How many times a day do they come in? Two times at least, in the morning and uh, in the evening till 8 o'clock. We sell baguette. Wow. Baguette, 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 baguette. What time do you start in the morning? 2 o'clock, most of the time. This poor guy is working 16 hours a day. Yeah, you need a lot of love and a lot of craziness to... I feel for you, I know, <laughs> I've done the same myself. That's why I love French bakeries. Sebastian is one of those guys so passionate about what he does. He understands the way the Parisians eat the bread. I've got to try some of your baguettes. Give me one of your best baguettes. Let me just try a little bit. Oh, oh superb. The, the smell, the, the smell inside, you've got a slight sour in there as well. But listen, listen to this. That, that makes a good baguette. Mm. You see that structure? You see that structure? If in the future you ever buy a baguette and it doesn't look like that, Take it back and come to this guy's bakery and buy one. <laughs> Crispy, lots of flavour. That's a fantastic baguette. As a baker, I know what good bread is. And I love that celebration of bread. And Paris knows what good bread is. That is worth a clap. Delicious. I'm taking the metro across town on the trail of another signature French bake. It's an iconic part of the national food identity, and it's eaten all over the world. For me, it's the bake by which any good baker is judged. During my professional career, I've made tens of thousands of croissants. Now, I'm in Paris, the home of the croissant, 
and I want to find the very best one. So I've come to the bakery of the best croissant baker in Paris, Laurent Duchesne, and it seems that words got out. It's a hell of a queue. So this must be one fantastic croissant. What could be more French than the croissant? Well, actually, it's based on an Austrian bake introduced to Paris in the 18th century and made popular by Queen Marie Antoinette, who was homesick for her Austrian homeland. This is the fella that we're queuing up for. It smells amazing. Oh, it's got a bit of tension there as well. The smell is really buttery. And look at my fingers. See the little grease marks on it? That tells you it's a good croissant straight away. Less talk, more eat. More. Oh. It's got a slight crispiness on the outside, but as you bite in it, it flakes in your mouth. As you bite in through the layers, the butter just bang, 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 just released onto your tongue. It tastes amazing. I'm fascinated to know how this guy won the best croissant in Paris. Bonjour. Hello, Paul. Laurent. Nice meeting you. Laurent Duchesne is the baker responsible for all these amazing looking croissants and pastries. And I'm delighted that he's invited me to join him in the kitchen. I love all this. So that's the place where we, we make all the croissants every day. So that, that's the dough we prepared yesterday, which has proofed in the fridge overnight. Yes. Laurent produces 800 croissants a day, and he's perfected every stage of the baking process. So the thickness is very important of the dough and the batter. So the depth is probably about nine mil. <laughs> about nine mil. <laughs> it's nine, 10 mil. Now Laurent is layering dough butter dough. This gives the croissant its characteristic flaky appearance. Now, you're using a good quality French butter. Of course. We have a special butter which is coming from poitou Charente. It's a countryside where we have a lot of milk, a lot of uh, co. The quality of the and milk? The quality is... of milk is very important for the butter. OK. That's a top tip from Laurent. If you layer the dough with top-notch butter, you get an incredibly light and flavoursome croissant. So now we're going to fold it in two, and then in two again. I call that a book turn. A book turn. Livre. Exactly. Uh, Book turn or double turn, however you want to call it. To make the perfect croissant, you must get those layers of dough and butter. I love this. I love the... It smells like a bakery I used to work in. And it actually smells like bakeries I've worked in for many, many years. Uh, it feels like home to me. I love it. Laurent book folds and rolls his dough once more before he's ready to form those distinctive crescent shapes. And then we're going to cut it as a triangle like this. So this is where you have your, your triangle? That's the triangle. Fold it one time, and then you roll it as evenly as you can. I love being in a bakery with another baker who knows what they're doing. There's something special. That, there's like a, a camaraderie around dough. I used to say, you know, you roll it like you are swimming. You're... Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to create something magical from flour. It's deeply satisfying, and you must try it at home. One of the things when you make your croissant like this, if you put a bit of tension in there, and what that does is tightens it up slightly as you roll it up. So a bit of tension, just tack it at the bottom. And when you roll up, try not to put too much pressure on there, just on the side, roll it up. Just a little tap. Make sure that that base stays on the tray and doesn't roll like this. Once Laurent and his team have hand-rolled 800 croissants, they're left to prove overnight. They look great, all like soldiers in lines. They're then given an egg wash, and finally, they're ready for baking. Making one great croissant is an achievement, but Laurent and his team achieve perfect croissants every time, every day. Someone in Paris is gonna have a good breakfast. When you think of France, you think of Paris. When you think of Paris, you think of croissant. And for me, as a baker, coming in, making croissant with the best croissant maker in Paris, fantastic. Merci, Laurent. Merci, Paul. Superb. I'll Merci. leave you to it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> My work here is done.
Coming up... Wow. I discover a patisserie masterpiece. Look at that, look at the detail on that. It's a work of art. And I take inspiration from a local landmark to create my own Parisian bake. It's OK. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, chef. Good job. Welcome to Paris. This is a city that has inspired my love of baking. I've visited the boulangeries of Paris and tasted the best they have to offer. It tastes amazing. It feels great in your mouth. But Parisian baking isn't just about flavour, it's about style and elegance. Something you'll see in the windows of the patisseries that light up the city streets. Each one of these tarts has had a, a syrup been reduced to create the topping. And then they put a beautiful glaze on the top. And they created magic. And the flavors are exquisite. These are works of art. These, this shop isn't just selling baked goods. It's selling artwork. Look at it. Everywhere you turn, Parisian patisseries set new standards in food presentation. But I'm heading to a famous Parisian institution that represents the very finest in French baking style. When I was a little kid leaving school, I used to always go to the local bakery and get a chocolate eclair, which is basically a shoe bun with cream with a little bit of chocolate on the top. Then I heard about this place, Faujon. It's meant to be the best patisserie in the whole of Paris. Wow. Think the finest jewelry shop you've ever been into in your life. Cross with the Louvre meets a bakery. And they come up with that. They look absolutely beautiful. Now, I'm all for style, but you've got to back that up with a little bit of substance too. Established in 1886 by Auguste Fauchon, a former street vendor, Fauchon has become a watchword for French-style luxury cakes and pastries. Hello, Bonjour. Monsieur. Hello. Sasha has been part of the gourmet team at Fauchon for the past three years. Are these all the range of eclairs that you do? Yes. They look incredible. <laughs> they look French. <laughs> they look French. You see, I think you may have something there, yes. Could I try one of these, please, with the stripes? Okay. The eclair bleu blanc, rouge. Bleu blanc. The French colors. Yes. And the British. <laughs> of course, too. <laughs> They do taste amazing. <laughs> the strawberry in there is really strong. It's beautiful. It's light. But the shoe bun is so delicate, it melts in the mouth. Now, this really is top-loaded. I've made eclairs before, and I've made a lot of eclairs before. Not quite as French as that. The French word eclair literally means lightning. But there's some dispute over whether this name refers to the glistening chocolate icing or the speed at which these cakes are usually devoured. Oh, wow. OK. It is delicious. The flavour of the hazelnut that comes through is gorgeous. Wow. There is certainly a Parisian style, which is very, very elaborate, yes. flamboyant. Yes. They look amazing. They taste incredible. Of course. But what gets me the detail. Yes, very I mean, they look as and if they have nice. jewels. This is, this, is something, this is something else. This is another level. Now, being in Paris, the Mona Lisa. I mean, look at that. Look at the detail on that. It's a work of art. So I'm going to bite into this now, this pair of eyes. I'm getting the almond through in there. That's delicious. Yeah, chocolate I mean, and almond inside. Yes. I was worried that it was all about style and no substance, but to be honest, they taste amazing. I mean, they are absolute works of art. Merci, Sasha. Je vous en prie. Au revoir. À bientôt. Au revoir. Fauchon is unlike any patisserie I visited before and represents everything I love about this city. Refined elegance and an artistic heritage makes Paris a joy to explore. The place we're going to now is Sacré-Cœur, which just happens to be the second highest part of Paris. 
<sighs> Gotta build up a sweat for it. I wanted to see this place for ages. Sacre Coeur, the Sacred Heart. It looks like a massive whip meringue sitting on top of Paris. The history of this place is fascinating. The first bishop of Paris was a guy called Saint Denis, or Denis, who was beheaded by the Romans. And the story goes, when they beheaded him, his body picked up his own head and it carried on saying the sermon all the way to the top of here, where it eventually died and dropped and they built one of the first churches here on Montmartre. The view from here is incredible. That is Paris. I've loved everything about my first visit to this great city. And to mark the occasion, I want to add my own twist to a French classic. And I'm taking my inspiration from a famous local landmark. To make my bake, I'm heading to Patisserie Stura, which opened its doors in 1730 and has been wowing customers ever since. Now look at this little fella here. Tarte of Citron. These are little pearls, all of them are delicious. Uh, bonjour, le chef. Bonjour, enchanté, oui. Jeffrey Kanya is the head baker here at Stora and has offered to help me out. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use this tat as a template to try and make the Eiffel Tower out of choux pastry or chocolate eclair, if you like. It's the same mixture, so the whole thing would be like one massive chocolate eclair. Oh, hello, that should work. I've never done it before, so I'm just going to freehand it, but I have Jeffrey is the chef of this beautiful patisserie. We're going to make this together. Now, to start with, we need to put the pan on the heat. We start by mixing equal parts of milk and water with butter. After warming through, Jeffrey adds a couple of tablespoons of sugar. So how many years, Jeffrey, have you been making eclairs? Uh, 10 years. 10 years, wow. 10 years. Whipping up a good old-fashioned choux pastry, the flour goes in next. It's second nature to a French pastry chef like Jeffrey. Oh, there you go. If you look inside there now, it's beginning to come together into one ball and it gets softer and softer and softer. The paste is transferred to a large mixing bowl before we add the eggs. One egg at a time. One egg. I can count, you see. Un egg. Un egg? Un oeuf. Un oeuf. Un oeuf. Un oeuf. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Each time you add an egg, you have to beat the pastry vigorously with a wooden spoon. And this requires a bit of elbow grease. Your arm's OK. Yeah, yeah, it's OK. <laughs> Do you want me to have a go? Yes. OK, it's OK. Ah, it's very different. Yes. Keep adding the eggs until you get the right consistency. So if you look at this mixture now, how soft and glossy it is. That's good. And that is what your shoe pastry should look like. Job done on the pastry mixture. It's time to get creative. I'm going to try and make the base. Now, bear with me. I've never done this before. Try and keep it nice and gently. That's the basic shape of the Eiffel Tower. Yes. And then you can crisscross. So you start from the bottom, go up and across. So you're zigzagging all the way up to make the girders look authentic. Once you've got the basic shape, this needs to be baked off. Now, we're going to bake that at 200 for around 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Should be good. My Eiffel Eclair is ready. It's good. Chef, is it OK? Yes. I think it's it amazing. Looks, it looks similar. Yes, and same, and same. Once the Eclair pastry is cooled, I can add some architectural touches. I'm decorating with chocolate fondant icing. And there's a knack to this too. So as you're doing it, just put a little bit of pressure on the bag. Don't force it too much. And it will find its way. So don't squeeze too hard, just a constant pressure. And what I'm going to do is put a couple of highlights down here. Not all the way. It's knowing when to stop decorating something like this. But for me, that is the Eiffel Tower made out of shoe pastry, made in the oldest patisserie, Paris. It's OK. It's OK. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy with that. So a unique eclair to symbolize the charm and beauty of this amazing city. I've waited a long time to visit the home of French baking and it's surpassed all my expectations. I love Paris. Do you know what it is? They don't know the words that'll do because that just won't do. So whatever they make are pearls, they're bits of magic and they taste exquisite. Paris is one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been to. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. City Bakes has taken me to places that I hardly know, but this time it's different. We're in Britain, we're in London, and I know a little bit about British baking. This time I'm going to show you my London by showcasing its stellar baking heritage. That's what I'm talking about. Massive cake, loads of layers, loads of cream. I'll be dropping in on a new generation of artisan bakers. Now you see that is what a proper loaf is all about. And visiting one of my old haunts. Now this place is very special to me. To create the ultimate afternoon tea. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Hollywood. Which goes down a storm. In my quest to find the best of the world of baking, I'm on home turf. London has a reputation for being the food capital of the world. It's one of the most visited cities in Europe and home to seven and a half million people. I'll always be a proud northerner, but for a budding baker at the age of 23, London was the place I needed to be. One of the reasons I actually came to London was because I was offered a job at the Dorchester. I mean, you don't turn jobs down at the Dorchester. I was the youngest head baker that I'd ever had. But coming to London, it was also about being in the focal point of food. This is the place where all the chefs want to work and it made a massive impression on me. I spent all my free time exploring the history of this city. From the buzzy market square of Covered Garden to its elegant Victorian arcades. When it came to baking, it was the River Thames that helped revolutionize our food. In the days of the British Empire, Merchant ships laden with spices and exotic fruits made their way into the city from around the world. And for those wealthy enough to buy these exotic foods, there was only one place to go. When I lived in London, there was a lot of food places I liked to visit. And the place I'm going to take you to now is one of the oldest, actually. It's over 300 years old. It's the Queen's Grocer. Opulence underlined. The stuff they have in there is unbelievable. Fortnum & Mason is London's most luxurious grocer and has been the shop of choice for high society and royalty since 1707. Morning. Well famous for its picnic hampers crammed with fine foods and preserves, it's also home to one of the most glorious tea salons in London. And if you're after British baking classics, this is a great place to find them. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. These represent some of my favorite bakes in the UK. The gorgeous lemon drizzle. Then you have the Dundee cake. Then you have the steak kidney pie. Then you have the classic British pork pie. We brought a lot to the table, haven't we, in Britain? Pork pie's gotta be right up there. Now look at these guys, another favorite of mine. The Scotch egg. It's basically sausage meat, which is deep fried in breadcrumb. And actually, Fortnum and Mason claim that they invented the Scotch egg. The thing is about British bacon, it tastes amazing. It's all about the taste. Mm. 
Do you know what? A Scotch egg made well. You can't beat it. It's just absolutely beautiful. Us Brits are so obsessed with our baked goods that the industry is worth a staggering £3.4 billion pounds a year. Oh, there's a great butter in there as well. However, there is one British classic that you can't buy at Fortnum's. It's impossible to talk about baking in Britain without a nod to the guilty pleasure that is sliced white bread. It's the perfect fit for that great British institution, the bacon butty. Look at that fella. As a lifelong baker, sliced bread should be sacrilege, but I must confess, I love it. This is a great carrier for a sandwich, as long as you buy a decent one. And to be honest, who doesn't like a bacon and egg sandwich? Needs a cup of tea, though. There it is, and John to a cup of tea as well. Oh, thank you. British bakers revolutionised baking with the mass-produced loaf back in the 50s. But times have changed. And today, London's in the throes of a traditional bread-making renaissance. In the shadow of the Shard, tucked under the arches of London Bridge, Borough Market is London's oldest. And trading began here as early as the 13th century. Artisan food, and more importantly for me, artisan baking is alive and well in this market. Today, it's a popular stop-off for food lovers, Londoners popping out for lunch and wide-eyed tourists. I think you can judge a market by its bread. Good bread, good market. Bad bread, I wouldn't go in. I'm excited by what Borough's bakers are doing here. And to get in on the action, I'm on my way to meet master baker Matt Jones who's had a stall here for 15 years and whose bakery is just around the corner. Hiya, Matt. Good morning, Paul. How are you today? Nice to see you. Welcome. Fantastic range of breads here. Well, yeah, we've got some bits and pieces here to show you. Got a nice brown sourdough, a raisin sourdough. Nice. Um, this is our 100% rye. That's this, lovely looking life. That is, trust me, that took years to develop. Now, you see, that is what a proper loaf is all about. When you normally think of British bread, you think of the sliced stuff, but oh no, this is the new generation of bread in this country. In fact, it's the old generation come back. What sets sourdough apart from the mass-produced bread is that it's not made with manufactured yeast, but with one that's homegrown, giving it a unique and subtle flavor. You could just eat that on its own. Yeah, lovely, I mean, yeah. I mean, the smell of that is totally different to the ones you normally buy in the shops, where I guarantee That'll make the best toast in the world. The flavour. You can smell the sour in there as well. I've got to try that. That's lovely, that. Lead the way. On a busy night, Matt bakes up to two tonnes of bread and supplies 60 restaurants and hotels, as well as local markets. He's still got a batch of white sourdough loaves to finish, so I've offered to lend him a hand. The thing is about sourdough, sourdough's been around for about four and a half thousand years. Um, basically, the first guys that made sourdough was ancient Egypt, two and a half thousand BC, and we're still doing exactly the same method now. It's just that what we're doing is using a, a full oven rather than a pot over a charcoal pit. Once in the baskets, the dough is popped into the prover to rise. And an hour and a half later, it's ready for the oven. Normally, if you're going to bake at home, 220, um, get your oven nice and hot in there for about half an hour, knock it down to about 200 for about 20 minutes. There you have it, the perfect loaf. It's as simple as that. There's nothing quite like the smell of freshly baked bread. And if it tastes half as good as it looks, Matt's going to have some very happy customers. What you're looking for on a good loaf is actually there's no splits on the side, which is good. It's split where you cut with a knife, which is a good, it's, it's expanded. It hollow, crispy, it's good to go. That's a nice looking loaf. I like the color of that actually. Hot out to the oven and with customers waiting, it's time for Matt to make some real dough. Three pound please. Okay, thank you. Can I help anybody? Hello, you want a white sour? There you go, you, yeah. thank you very much. It's still warm from the oven, 
I'm really excited to see people snapping up these loaves. Thank you very much. Sometimes you have to look back to move forward. And by taking inspiration from our baking heritage, Matt and other artisan bakers are doing British baking proud. Next, My City Bakes takes me on a trip down memory lane. This place is very special to me. I get my whites back on after a 15-year break. Try and keep it as small as possible so it's dainty. It's that attention to detail that I'm looking for. But will my ultimate afternoon tea be a runaway success? Can't wait to eat this myself. <laughs> or an absolute disaster? I think these are too big. Just look at that. I'm back on my old stomping ground in the English capital, London. So far, I've loved getting stuck into some great artisan bread making. But I want to make a very personal bake to celebrate this great city. I'm going to indulge myself and take a trip down memory lane. I'm actually on my way at the moment to a hotel that is very special to me. I used to work there about 15 years ago now. For me, it's one of the best hotels in the country. When you turn this corner, you understand why it's so special. Look at that. It's gorgeous. For me, it's the best of the best of British country houses. Clifton House in Berkshire has played host to virtually every British monarch since George I. In the 1920s, Clifton became London's most famous party house. Socialite Lady Astor famously threw lavish parties for the great and the good. Everyone from Charlie Chaplin to George Bernard Shaw were entertained there. I spent a very happy two years here as head baker and I'm thrilled to be back. Morning. Now this place is the place that is very special to me. That chair, this, this one here. This was my seat. This was my favorite place to hang out before my shift started. I used to sit here about three o'clock in the morning. I'd work five, six days a week sometimes. My coffee, talking to the duty manager. It's lovely being back. When I got out of the car, they actually said, welcome home. It's those little things. And it does now feel very special to me. But one of my favorite rooms in this hotel is just over there, and I want to show you. This room in particular is very special because you only have to look at the decor. You feel actually you're in a chateau rather than an English stately home. And there's a reason for that. It actually came from Versailles. They call it Madame de Pompadour's room. This was moved from Versailles to this house. And all the woodwork was brought with it. This room, again, is special because the Queen Mother, she had afternoon tea in this room. But also because of the view. Can you imagine living in a house like this? I want to do justice to this magical setting. So I'm going to pull out all the stops for my city bake and pay homage to the Queen Mum's favourite pastime, afternoon tea. Social historian James Sherwood knows all about high society and the origins of this very British ritual. The afternoon tea was an important event, wasn't it? It was. It was um, originated by the Duchess of Bedford, who was a great friend of Queen Victoria. And she found that at 4 p.m. or around about that time, that you start to suffer a sort of low, <laughs> and you sort of feel a bit limp and lifeless. And what do you need? You need a, a pot of Darjeeling and you need cucumber sandwiches. What else? I couldn't agree more. But in just over two hours, I have to serve my vision of the ultimate afternoon tea to 50 expectant guests. The bells. Brilliant. They've no idea that I'll be making it, and it's been 15 years since I stepped into this very kitchen. 
Morning, Chef. Morning, Paul. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good, mate. Good, good to see you. Good to see you. It's good to be back. So, have you been back in a professional kitchen for a while? Or 15 years ago. 15 years. Have you still got what it takes? Here? Nah, lost it years ago. <laughs> oh, <can't laughs> We're going to be in trouble. <laughs> It'll be all right. Chef Andre Garrett kindly lent me three members of his team to help me get ready for service. But we've never worked together before, so it's crucial that they know exactly what I want to achieve. I want to keep it as traditional as possible. I don't want to go too free throw in French. I want to keep it very basic, very British, but taste amazing. So I'm thinking of uh, lemon drizzle. I'm thinking strawberry barquettes. Sandwiches, again, soft as possible, as fresh as possible, sliced, thin, Cucumber, egg, beef, uh, a little bit of mustard on there. So something to just really celebrate British afternoon tea. All right? Time is tight. There's a lot at stake here, and the diners don't know it's me in the kitchen today. But I really want to impress. I just hope the lads can help me deliver. Try and keep it as small as possible so it's dainty, so when the top goes on, it sits pretty. A bit of jam in the middle, that'd be perfect. Yeah. I want to try and keep it half inch, so it's yeah. more of a bite. Two bites should be finished. Strawberries laying out like that on top of the barquette, nice and neat. Try and keep them all the same size. All the pastries have to be the same sort of size as that. So when someone picks it up, whether it's a scone, a barquette, a lemon drizzle, a Victoria sandwich, they all look the same size, and that is critical. It's that attention to detail that I'm looking for. While the lads are busy, I'm going to make one of my favourites. Now, I'm going to be making my scones, three different types. I'm going to do plain, fruit and walnut. Again, classic, but all looking exactly the same. A lot of five-star establishments use strong white flour, but you, you can't overwork it. That's the key thing. It keeps it light, keeps it moist. It's easy to make scones. You only need six ingredients. Add caster sugar to the flour, some softened butter, the magic ingredient baking powder, and some eggs. And begin to work that together in the bowl. And it starts to form fairly quickly. Then milk, full fat milk. Half to begin with. I'm happy with that mixture. It's quite sticky. That's the key thing. Pop that on the bench. Give the mixture a couple of folds until it comes together and divide into three parts. I've slightly undermixed it. Now, don't forget this is strong bread flour, so it's got gluten in it. The more that you work it, the tighter it'll be, the harder it'll be on the mouth when you eat it. So the whole beauty of it is just to bring it together so it breaks easily. The last thing I want to do is work this like a bread dough. Pop that in there. I've got a few sultanas going in there as well. And I just want to work that together into the, into the dough. Once you've worked most of the sultanas into the mix, take the second batch, add walnuts, and add it to the remaining sultanas. The third batch should remain plain. Roll it out so it's a good inch thick. Put your scone cutter in a little bit of flour and just cut down, and that's it. Place on baking parchment, but leave a bit of a space around each scone as they will expand. And do the same with the other varieties. Finally glaze with egg yolk. There you have it. Little beauties ready to go in the oven. Pop the scones into a nice hot oven at around 220 degrees for around 15 minutes. While my scones bake, the lads have been busy with their finishing touches. The barquettes are sprinkled with ground pistachio, the miniature sponges are being decorated, and the sandwiches are underway. So you've got your egg and cress, you've got your beef, you've got your cucumber, cucumber being sliced. Being sliced now. Oh, that's fantastic. I can't wait to eat this myself. <laughs> so far, so good. And look at these little stunners. Happy? Yeah, I'll do. Thank you. I'm chuffed how they've turned out. Everything's coming together and not a moment too soon, as upstairs, the guests are starting to arrive. But back in the kitchen, there's a problem. I think these are too big. I think they need to be cut in half. You want them cut right in half? Probably. I don't mean that well, ideally, yeah, but I think they're going to have to go that way. 
I can't. I think they're gonna have to be cutting off. They're just look at that. I can't let those go upstairs. That's like a duck of butty there. You could fill that with chips. We're in a five-star hotel. And so I've asked them just to cut that in half, and then we'll invert it and put a little spread on the top, make them look a bit prettier. This mistake is going to cost us time, and the guests are already seated and waiting. I want them all the same size as the, like a Battenberg, you know? Yeah, Think of the size of the Battenberg. Fantastic. They look better. With the Docker butties transformed, we're back on track, and just in time. That, for me, is good to go. So there it is, my perfect afternoon tea. Soft, bite-sized beef, cucumber and egg sandwiches, my wonderful walnut, raisin and plain scones, and to crown it off, a selection of classic British cakes. Service. As my afternoon tea makes its grand entrance upstairs, thank you very much. Very nice. The diners still have no idea that I'm behind all of this. I hope they like it. Absolutely amazing. It's beautiful. It seems to be going down well. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, a very warm welcome to Clifton House. Just if I could make a small announcement, just to let you know that your afternoon tea today was baked by, um, well, none other than uh, Paul Hollywood. Hello, everybody. It's been 15 years, actually, since I've been back to Clifton and actually put whites on and gone into the kitchen, so it's been a long time. The team have been fantastic downstairs, a really great job, but I wanted to celebrate British cakes. So you have Battenberg, you have lemon drizzle, you have a meringue with a praline cream, you have a mini Victoria sandwich, and you have a strawberry barquette. All these were on the menu when I was doing the afternoon teas at this house 15 years ago. I hope you liked it. Thank you very much, tuck in, please do. <laughs> it's been such a long time since I've done this, I'm dying to know what they think. Are you enjoying your, uh, your afternoon tea? Mm. Delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> your poll just, um, just now around the table as to whether we were scones or scones here. It's scones. It's scones. <laughs> enjoying your tea? Absolutely fantastic. My afternoon tea seems to have hit the spot, and it's been a real privilege to get back in the kitchen and serve up some great food in this historic and elegant house. I love actually working in the Clifton today, making afternoon tea and making it British again. I think there's been far too many French influences on the pastry side, but today I've brought it back to British. And it was lovely hearing the people upstairs talk to me saying, oh, we like the Battenberg, oh, we like this, we like that. And actually, what a lot of people said to me was, we love the walnut scones. I've had a ball, if I'm brutally honest, coming back to this hotel after 15 years being away and working in and put my chef's whites on, for me, personally, do you know what? I've realised I really miss it. That's what an afternoon tea should be, a celebration of British food. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, the places and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami, European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. Today I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia. Do you like my new gaff? Nice. This time, I'm living the life of a czar. Wow, that is one of the prettiest things I have ever seen. Where the food is as rich as the culture. And this is gold leaf for your pot now. Amazing. I follow in the footsteps of the glitterati. Elton John, Tina Turner, Elizabeth Taylor. Wow, they've all stayed here, haven't they? I recreate St. Petersburg's baking heritage. That is 800 years of Russian bacon. It's stunning. And I get the VIP treatment in Russia's finest food hall. Looking forward to this. You 
see, I go to the ends of the earth just to find you good bacon. When they built the magnificent city of St. Petersburg, it was all about showing off Russian culture and sophistication to the rest of the world, with knobs on. Whatever the rest of Europe did, the Russians could do it bigger and better. And when it comes to baking, Russia's all about traditional pies, sugar-laden bakes and rich rye breads. Great comfort food to keep you warm inside. And boy, do you need it. I kid you not, it must be about minus 12, minus 13, with the wind as well, probably minus 20. So I've got probably about four or five layers on the top, about three on the bottom, fur line boots. And to be honest, I'm still cold. <laughs> it might be a bit on the chilly side, but this picture book city has so much to offer. And that is one hell of a view. Looks like a massive meringue. This is one of St. Petersburg's most iconic buildings. The Church of Our Saviour on Spilled Blood is so ornate, it took 24 years to complete. It's the only way to see the Church of the Spilled Blood, with snow hammering against it. It's beautiful. If I'm going to survive these temperatures, I'm going to have to do as the locals do. Morning. <laughs> what do you like to buy? Uh, shabka. And get myself kitted out with a Russian Ushanka hat. A bit much. <laughs> I like the little moth. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? For my first taste of Russian flavours, I'm heading to St. Petersburg's most extravagant food hall. Kubets Eliseev has been a firm favourite with the Russian elite since 1902. Wow. And the store's VIP attaché, Viktor Yavoronok, is going to show me what my rubles could buy me. Hello, Hello Paul. How, How are you? you? Hello, I'm very good, thank you. What an amazing place this is. It has got that opulence. It's a bit like the food halls in London, but I think it's another step up. Maybe. Well, we're trying to keep it imperial, classy, for a royal society and, you know, high society. Kubet Eliseev hasn't always looked this glamorous. During the Soviet Union, it was state-owned, and you'd have struggled to get your hands on the luxury goods lining the shelves today. From the handmade confectionaries and the fine cheeses to luxury vodkas. It's all here for the taking, if you've got the money. Brilliant. But I've spied the ultimate extravagance. Run through some of these caviars, which is a good caviar? All caviar is good, you know, good when you can buy it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now here, that's a Sturgeon Imperial, and that's the best one. Sturgeon yeah. caviar is, is, yeah. is the best. I want to try all of it, really. I could see. I could sit down with some vodka and try a lot of caviar, if I'm brutally honest. Before I get too distracted, there's one more department I really must check out while I'm here. There's something that very close to my heart, some of the bread. This is the traditional bread. You like cannot that. find anything more traditional, you know, in breads in Russia. Okay, that's what I think of when I think of Russia. I think of that rye bread. You think of that heavy rye, almost uh, the black rye. And that's exactly the stuff I'm talking about. So can I try? Want to try? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a great looking loaf, isn't it? It's heavy, which is what a rye normally is. The Borodinsky is one of the most popular rye breads in Russia and was inspired by Russia's battle of Borodino. Wow. The deadliest day in the Napoleonic Wars. That is one of the most potent ryes I think I've ever eaten. It tastes, it's almost caraway, aniseed flavor, but heavy, dense, that is exceptional. A Russian rye in one of the best food halls in the world. Not a bad way to start my trip. But before I leave, Victor's got one last treat in store for me. I'm looking forward to this. The lavish surroundings of the store's grand dining room usually play host to Russia's high society. 
but today I'm getting the VIP treatment with the room all to myself. Just grab it with a spoon. OK. Victor's serving up some of the best sturgeon caviar. This is decadence, Russian style. Oh, that is good. I see your eyes started to spark. Yeah. <laughs> It melts in the mouth, though. It really does melt in the mouth. That's the first Russian caviar I've ever had in Russia. And that was delicious. That was very, very nice. And I believe we need some vodka right now. How do you say cheers in Russian? Будем здоровы. Is there an we'll easy way? Будем здоровы. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. I'll take this one for the team. I could get used to this. I've seen where the glitterati shop. Now I'm off to see where they stay. In the heart of the city, off one of St. Petersburg's grandest squares, is the five-star Hotel Astoria. Since it opened in 1912, it's welcomed some of the world's biggest names. But I'm not here to schmooze. I'm here to meet one of the brightest stars in Russian baking. Right, I'm on my way to see the executive pastry chef of this beautiful hotel, Julia Ivanova. Now, she's apparently one of the best pastry chefs in St. Petersburg. So, I'm here to check out what real Russian baking is all about. Julia and her brigade are in the middle of preparing a traditional afternoon tea. Hi, Paul. Hello. The highlight of which is her speciality, a titan of Russian baking the Medific honey cake. This is a very traditional Russian cake uh, called Medavik, or honey cake. Honey cake. Yeah, there is a nice history. It goes to beginning of 19th century, mm -hmm. and our queen, Elizabeth, um, she didn't like honey at all. Somehow they had a new pastry chef, and he didn't know this detail, and he wanted to impress her, so he created a honey cake and presented to her, and she tried it, and she actually loved it, and that became her favorite cake. Wow. So since that, it's um, very common in Russia. The classic version of this cake consists of layered sponge, but Yuli has created a more refined version by ingeniously using a mix that is part biscuit, part sponge. The biscuit element is softened by the sweetened cream filling, and the whole thing is finished off with a flurry of decoration and a fittingly regal touch. This is gold leaf, your pot now. Yes, we love gold in Russia. So this is uh, our honey cake. Would you like to try? I think I will do. Look, look at that. So that represents to me a building. There's the meringue again, which when you think of the, the church of the spilt blood, there's the meringue. Then you have these beautiful little wafers. Raspberry sitting on the top of that, and then pure gold sitting on top of that. Isn't that brilliant? I've got to try some. Do you mind if I took in? Feel free. Ah, it's nice. Oh, it's softer than I thought it would be. Yeah, it's very fat and sweet. Maybe you know not. It's a bit like me, though. You just described me, fat and sweet. That's actually with the fruit. Mm. That tartness coming from the fruit together with the whole thing is beautiful. I love the fact that Julia put a twist on an old tradition, so it's more biscuit-like. It starts off being quite brittle, and then as the cream softens it, it becomes more like a sponge, but the texture of it is spot on. And she's producing magic in her kitchen. But Julia is not the only star who's been resident at the Astoria. Madonna, Gary Kasparov, Rasputin. Rasputin. Elton John, Tina Turner, Elizabeth Taylor. Wow, they've all stayed here, haven't they? In her 30 years at the hotel, Lydia Luentuna has seen her fair share of movie stars and celebrities pass through the Astoria. It's such an eclectic oh, mix of people. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, Vladimir Lenin. Yeah. Wow, Lenin. Mm -hmm. In 1919, a certain Vladimir Lenin gave a speech from the balcony of the presidential suite. Thousands of supporters are gathered outside in the square to hear the leader of the Bolshevik party make one of his many speeches that would lead to the creation of the Soviet Union. This is where Lenin gave his speech. I'm just going to go after have, have a quick look. That's a great view, isn't it? 
But the history attached to it is just incredible. I mean, Lenin. I mean, Lenin was here talking to the people, giving his speech. Yeah, very poignant. Next, this old dog gets taught a neat new trick. A novel pastry ingredient guaranteed to knock his socks off. Vodka? Yes, Russian vodka. And that's an excuse to have one of these in the bakery. And I pay a visit to one of Russia's grandest of grand palaces. Wow, that is one of the prettiest things I have ever seen. I'm in St. Petersburg, the jewel in Russia's crown. There's an extravagance to life here, from the food to the architecture. And nothing is more extravagant than the Winter Palace, the most jewel-dropping building I think I've ever seen. It's just staggering. It makes Buckingham Palace, well, look like a two-up, two-down, really. I would like to pick up the electric bill, though. It must be massive. Inspired by my nighttime visit to the Winter Palace, I've got the bug. So today, I'm off to see the Tsar's summer residence with the help of a couple of trusty friends. All right, boys, we need a nice comfy ride. No racing, OK? Just be nice. Right, I'm in Pushkin Park, which is about 25k south of St. Petersburg. These guys here are my new horsepower. Two horsepower. Mosha and Buiskin. I've heard that hidden away deep in this magical park, there's a little bakery that serves tasty Russian pastries. Now all I've got to do is find it. Just look at that scenery. It's a real magical place to be. It is a bit like a fairy tale. It's, it doesn't feel real. And en route, we pass one of the most stunning buildings in Russia, Catherine the Great's Bolt Hole, her summer palace. Wow. That is one of the prettiest things I have ever seen. Catherine I was a lady with expensive tastes. 100 kilograms of real gold was used to decorate this Rococo palace, which was built to outdo even the excess and grandeur of Versailles. It's just stunning, absolutely stunning. I'm not here just to look at the palace, I've come for the baking. In the grounds of Catherine Park, there's a modest little converted church that serves up traditional Russian cakes fit for an empress. Hello. Hello. Wow, what a great place. Uh, yes. <laughs> now, looking down here, I recognise a lot of them. So, eclairs, quiche, panorosa, truffles. But those on the end, what, what, what are these? Batrushka. Batrushka. Could I, could I try a little bit, Yes, please? of course. Are these very popular with the people that come yes, in? Yes, yes. Let me have a quick look. What you can say about it? it? Tastes delicious. Yes. It's very, very good. So, in Britain, we make a bread roll and we put cream inside it. Mm -hmm. It's like an ice bun. And that tastes like an ice bun with curd cheese rather than cream. But actually, the curd cheese adds another element to it and it just tastes... Beautiful. This melts in the mouth. So when you were growing up, when you were a little girl, did your family make this? Yes, my grandmother, my mother do it. And me too. And you do? Yes. Little taste of Russia, right there. <laughs> I'll finish this one now. It's delicious. So far, I've lived the high life, tasting my way through some of Russia's best sweet treats. But for my city bake, I'm coming back down to earth with a good, honest Russian pie. I'm headed to a place now that apparently makes the best pies in St. Petersburg, a subject that is very close to my heart and indeed my stomach. Stola is a chain of 13 traditional bakeries and cafes with a well-earned reputation for producing finely crafted Russian pies. 
and with 40 mouth-watering varieties, each stuffed with a delicious savoury or sweet filling, from rabbit to apricot, I'm going to be spoilt for choice. The smell in here is incredible. These pies look amazing. Could I try a little piece, please? Yes. Thank you. From palaces to pies, the Russians do everything on a grand scale. And if these taste half as good as they look, I'm in for a real treat. Chicken and rice. It looks amazing. Now you're talking. It tastes amazing. The pastry is to die for. But one thing that gets me, it's quite sweet. It's a bit like a brioche, but it looks like a bread, but it flakes like a puff pastry. I'm still unsure what it is. Like many winning formulas, Stoller's exact dough recipe is a heavily guarded secret, which is why it's keeping me guessing. Back home, I normally make a pie using short crust or hot water crust pastry. But here, the pies are much more elaborate. They add yeast, so it's a cross between a pastry and a dough. It's then sweetened and layered with butter. Welcome to my kitchen. What a fantastic yes. place. Master baker Alexander Vasiev finishes off the mix with a typically Russian touch. Vodka. Yes, vodka. Look, Russian vodka, Russian original vodka. <laughs> in, uh, that's an excuse to have one of these in a bakery. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, uh, we need loads of vodka. And we need a pool table, probably a dartboard too. Wow, that's incredible. I'm obviously not going to find out the exact dough mixture, but I would love to find out how they make their pies look so good. This is with mushroom, potatoes and cheese. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but these pieces here, how are you making these? Just the hand work. So you're, you're rolling it out and yes. then cutting it with a only knife? hand work, only hand. OK, Paul. OK, Try so you're, you're stretching this yes. and laying it on, pushing it down. Okay. And then you're putting layers and layers on. Uh, yes, yes. This is almost like doing a lattice work on the top. So it, it's really Russian, ancient tradition that's yes. been passed down. Yes, yes. It's a Russian soul in this pie, you know? Yes, I think you're right. The amount of work that's gone in there is so impressive. But that gives me an idea. Of... I love Alex's passion. I think the pies are fantastic, but I think it's my turn now, and I'm going to do a beef version. For today's City Bake, I'm going to make a traditional closed oblong pie called a kulibak, and Alex is even letting me get my hands on some of his secret pastry dough. Thank you. Although this recipe would work just as well with short crust pastry. First, you'll need to gently roll out the dough until you have an oblong piece about 30 by 15 centimetres. We have our base there. We're going to put a little bit yes. of egg around the yes, outside. Just a little bit. Look. And that just helps it stick, yes. basically, when it all comes together again. Now, the filling for this is beef stock, egg, which has been cooked and shredded, beef, mince, and I've got cooked onions. Now, all those go together with some seasoning, and you end up with your filling for the pie. So if I try and shape this into the middle, it smells amazing. Yes. OK, and now? Pinch it. Yeah, yes. Once the centre parting is stuck together, fold the ends up and flip the pie over. Place it on a baking tray and paint with egg wash. So again, the egg wash going on is going to help anything that goes on top stick to it so it bonds to it and it gives it a beautiful shine and a good rich colour as well. Yes. Now, normally, when you take it at that stage, you could bake it like that and eat it like that, not a problem, but Russia takes it to another level. These are the bits that you're going to use to decorate, yeah? Yes. Alexander's already stamped out some of the shapes with a pastry cutter and the rest are done by hand. Look, and... Okay. How long in Russia have they been making kulabak? From uh, 12th century. Wow. Yes. That's old. This 800 yeah, yeah, ages ago. Years old. Yes. It looks yeah. so ornate. This is freestyle, you know? Yeah, yeah. This is just freestyle. Oh, yeah. We're freestyling a pie. Yeah. Nice. One last glaze, and it's good to go in the oven. It does look good. Now, that's going to be baked off 200 for around half an hour? Yes, 200. OK, fantastic. While we bake this off, we're going to have a little bit of a vodka. Well, 
It'd be a shame not to dip into that bottle. That's it. Lovely. Looks great, doesn't it? I love the colour. Gorgeous flake on it. Look at that. Mm. Oh, wow. The pastry's got that little bit of sweetness in there. And with that beef filling with the onion, it melts in the mouth. That is 800 years of Russian bacon right there. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning. Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you, you. Topol. Spot on. I've absolutely fallen in love with St. Petersburg. It's unbelievably beautiful, but the baking was fascinating. Modern baking in Russia is almost identical to the rest of Europe, but they still hold on to their own baking tradition. Kulabak being the ultimate. If I'd have known St. Petersburg was gonna be this pretty, I would have come many, many years ago. This is a truly magical city. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, <laughs> the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami to the European chic of Paris. This time, it's the sunshine and the scenery of southern Italy that beckons. Where else are you going to get something like that? I've heard the food isn't too bad either. I immerse myself in local baking customs. <laughs> and savour an iconic Italian dish in the city of its birth. Oh. My quest to find the best of world baking is taking me to the beautiful Amalfi coast of southern Italy. It's so pretty. I mean, look at that. But first, I'm heading to Naples, a city full of classical monuments and beautiful architecture. But Napoli, as the locals call it, has a lived-in look. It's curiously chaotic and, if I'm honest, a bit dilapidated. But it's alive. It's vibrant, it's historic, it's a little bit dirty, it's busy. Oh, I love it. There's an edginess to Naples, and it's probably because it lies in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, that famous volcano that erupted and covered Pompeii and Herculaneum, and the streets are paved with the lava. So there's that, that part of Naples that, at any minute, something's about to happen. Naples is acknowledged as the home of pizza, I know it best for the Neapolitan pizza named after the city, but I don't know much else about the food culture of this region. If I want to find out about the local baking traditions, then I'm going to need some help, and I know just the man. <laughs> oh, oh. I've known Gennaro Cantaldo for many years. He's a successful chef and restaurateur in the UK, but he grew up here on the Amalfi Coast. So pleased to see you And you, mate, and you. Welcome to but Naples. I knew I could rely on Gennaro to give me a warm welcome. I want you to show me the best bakeries that Naples has. No trouble. We have to go that way now. OK. Let me show you as soon as we reach there, OK? Right, OK. Naples is so beautiful. I'm going to show you. Wow. Ice cream, look. First stop is the traditional Italian bakery, Scartuccio, which was established in 1905, and there's something familiar in the window. Obviously, you can see that's Vesuvius. Well, yes, that is the Vesuvio when boom, exploded. <laughs> I love the way they even celebrate an active volcano. <laughs> Inside, we're greeted by an incredible selection of bakes and treats, and we're not alone. There's a lot of people in here. 
That's exciting. It's an indication of what you're in. It's popular, even for people in Naples. I'm spoilt for choice here. I could happily tuck into any one of these great-looking bakes, but one in particular has caught my eye. If only I knew how to ask for it. Spot, spot, spot. Svo? Not a spot, spot. Svo. Sfogliatella. Sfogliatella. You said okay. it. Ah. Sfogliatella literally means thin leaf layers, because that's what it looks like. Can I, can I try? Sfogliatella. Look at the layers. The layers are incredible. Grazie. I've actually never tried one before. I've seen them, but I've never tried one. Wow. It's filled with ricotta cream, semolina and fruit. Fascinating. The flavours with the cream and the fruit inside. With the pastry, the way that it's been done, it's been rolled the opposite way that you normally would. Normally you build your layers up like this. It's been done like this. Gennaro's brought me to the right place and I'm getting a taste for these Italian pastries. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I want to try another one. This pastry is called a cannoli, which means little tube. Oh, delicious. I'm pretty stuffed now. The skills involved in making everything is awesome. And this is delicious. You eat him well. Oh, more, bro. Yeah, come here. Thank you, Papa. No, oh, Papa. <laughs> For me, walking around a city is the best way to explore it. And to be honest, I need a walk after all those pastries. But in Naples street food culture, temptation is never far away. Test this, test this. Test it. What is test it? it? This is the first original Neapolitan pizza, fried pizza. Really? Fried pizza? Where did this come from? It is fried. This is the truly proper first Neapolitan pizza. Go on. In the days before ovens, pizza was fried, not baked. Back then, this was a peasant food for the cash-strapped Neapolitans who ate fried pizza on the go. It's different. I like the baked rather than the fried. It's not for me. He likes it, though. I just don't understand. <laughs> Frying may be the oldest way of cooking pizza, but the oldest pizzeria in Naples is just around the corner, Port Alba Antigua. Look at the date on that, 1738. Yeah, can you imagine that for how many years they've been making pizza? Well, it's nearly 300 years. 300 years. OK, we need to try this, mate. Possiamo avere due margherite, per favore? Grazie. E a Paul? This is weird. I'm more used to eating fish and chips wrapped in paper, but there's a technique, apparently. For close it, OK, turn them around and pull. Can you eat it like that? Eat it like that. Oh. I always thought, how can you eat a pizza on the move? The folding technique, I think, is fantastic. But I've got to get that tomato. Mm. The tomato is delicious. The sauce is excellent. This is a classic margarita pizza, created by a local chef in the 19th century to mark the visit of Queen Margarita of Savoy to Naples. Three colours, isn't it? You have the, the yeah. Italian flag, you have the mozzarella, you have the tomato, you have the basil. You know it. What does pizza mean to yeah. Naples? Pizza is Napoli. Pizza is a heart, heart, history, territory, love and passion. This is what it's all about, the passion of the people. It boils down to a street food. Yeah. But what is it about the pizzas here? What is it that goes into them and makes a difference? Well, it is the water. The water? Yeah. Water's water. No, no. Naples water, you can't drink it. But it's special for the pizza. How does that work? OK. <laughs> you can't, it's not good enough to drink. Drink. But, but it's what, good enough to go on a pizza? Yes. How, what's I it don't mean? know. Why? Because it's done fusions of, from the volcanic soil, which is come down, they go down sulphur inside. So you have the water with the sulphur, all the nutrients inside there, mixing with the gluten and the flour to create a very unique pizza base. And that's why the pizzas in Naples are so good. I'm not sure if Gennaro is kidding me here. Let's face it, it wouldn't be the first time. I think it's delicious. But what I do know is that this pizza dough tastes spectacular. I'm getting covered. I'm going to go. From a bake that characterizes this unique city where anything goes. Scusa, scusa, scusa. 
That's one way of crossing the road. <laughs> Did you see Paul Hayes? You have to be Neapolitan, Paul. We're heading to Patisseria Capriccio on the trail of the famous Neapolitan Baba. Baba's lovely. I've made Baba before. The French, French style. I'm fascinated to see what this is going to taste like. Baba is a small yeast cake, which takes its name from the Slavic word for grandmother. It's usually round in shape and flavoured with rum and sugar syrup. Jeez, Did I say flavoured? Make that drenched in rum. You can smell the alcohol, it's really strong. I mean, the, the texture's great. It's delicious, it's light. It's like, um, think of um, a whisk sponge soaked in a sugar syrup with a... Actually, it's quite strong in rum. Um, lots and lots of rum sitting on top of that. You probably couldn't drive, you'd be over the limit for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this Naples speciality has won its place in the local food culture. It's even celebrated in song. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Is it sweet Naples? <laughs> it's the rum. It's always the rum. <laughs> This is a great tasting baba, and the baker in me is desperate to have a nose around the kitchen. Uh, can I see how this made? Vai, to vai, vai. The ba? Vai, 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 vai. Vai dentro, Leto. Vai, get dentro, vai, vai. Va bene, va bene. Baba is made with a rich brioche type dough made of eggs, milk, and butter. This is the mix. This is the baba mix. You see how soft it is. It's an indication that's a really soft dough. That will look like that at the end. It was brought to Naples by French bakers working for Neapolitan families, and this tradition is being continued by brothers Raphael and Salvatore. Basically, the they're dissolving the sugar that's in there. So the sugar's in there, there's water, there's rum essence, there's rum. So that becomes the stock syrup. Right. Ah. OK. That's really unusual to soak the whole... Normally, I, I brushed it on, not soak the I whole did. thing. Ah, OK. OK. Chiudi, fuoco. Vedi? Ah, this. Chiuso. Tutto chiuso dentro. Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at the way it springs back. It is just like a sponge. I can't believe how much stock syrup actually goes into this. But the, the flavour is intense, I promise you. I love all that. It's so hands-on. Get your hands in there, get a feel for it, get stuck in. That's what baking is all about. Grazie. One of the things I will take away from Naples when I leave, they've given me a sense of... a sense of passion. I've always been quite a passionate man when it comes to the baking, but for me, I'm going to take that back with me, a little bit of Naples back to the UK with me. And I think my baking is going to be better for it. Next, my journey continues without my old friend and host. You take care, my friend. I'll see you soon. Ciao. As I take one of the world's classic drives along the beautiful Amalfi Coast. It's times like this I pinch myself. I'm just a, a baker from the Wirral. I take inspiration from this stunning setting. It's perfect now. To create a delicious chocolate caprese cake you can bake at home. Grazie. I'm in Italy on the Amalfi Coast, where my whistle-stop tour of the world's best baking cities has brought me to Naples, the birthplace of pizza. Oh. I've been wowed by the variety and flavour of the Naples bakes. And I've had my first taste of the local sfogliatella pastry. That's delicious. Naples claims to make the best sfogliatella in Italy. But 40 miles down the road, the bakers of Amalfi say their sfogliatella is best. This region of Italy has a history of feuds and boasting. So, what these bakers need is a proper judge. And only a trip to Amalfi will settle the matter. This is a fantastic road. It's beautiful. Hood down. What could be better? Life's good. The scenery is just awesome. 
there's been many, many movies made here, including Bond, and you do feel slightly Bond-like, if I'm honest, driving around here. It's so pretty. I mean, look at that. I want to live here. It's times like this I pinch myself. I'm just a, a baker from the Wirral. What am I doing driving a 1969 Alfa Romeo around the Malfi Coast? How lucky am I? Wow, I love the sea. Born and raised around the sea. It's always a special place to me. And this coastal setting, with its washed out colours and age old architecture, really is a bit special too. It's beautiful. It's Italian. Where else are you going to get something like that? I've heard the food isn't too bad either. As I explore further into Amalfi Town, it's like walking through centuries of history. It's gorgeous. Who else would build a church like that with steps like that? And then the whole idea of going up the steps, like going up to heaven, you're going up to see God. It's stunning, absolutely stunning. I could spend all day taking in Amalfi's historic sites, but I'm here to explore its baking traditions too. This cafe has stood here since 1830, and owner Andrea is the fifth generation of his family to make a local delicacy. It's a svogliatella. Ah, and this is from Amalfi? Yes. The bakers of Amalfi consider their svogliatella to be the best. And what makes their version different from the one I tasted in Naples is that this one comes topped with a cream called Santa Rosa. I'll do this for you guys, OK? It tastes delicious, but the cream was like, um, it's a bit like, you know when you're a kid and you used to have a vanilla custard? The custard is like that, but better, creamier. If I'm honest, I prefer these in Amalfi to the ones in Napoli, but keep that between yourselves, okay? In the kitchen, I find Catano preparing the next batch. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ah, OK. After the dough is rolled, it's brushed with melted butter. Put the butter in, you don't get the folds, you don't get those lines. So we stretch it to get this really tight, which makes sense. It's very, very thin, but you can see... You see how thin it is? It's thinner than a coin, a lot thinner than a coin. Then comes the important bit, as the dough is rolled into a long sausage. You stretch. Stretch, yes. OK. It's then sliced into individual portions. Stay. Ready to be shaped and filled. It sort of makes sense that you, you open it up with your fingers. Never actually seen this technique before, but this is the same as Naples at the moment. Just as in Naples, the filling is a mix of ricotta cheese, semolina, sugar and fruit. Seal it up. I love it. I could stay all day doing this. I like this. Va bene? Va bene questa qua. It feels great. I've learned something today. I've learned something very different. Adesso andiamo in forno. Va bene. Ah, now we want to see how they make Amalfi. It's flogletelli. OK. Adesso okay. prendiamo la crema. This Santa Rosa cream filling is made with milk, sugar, egg, flour and Amalfi lemons. So he's just piping it straight in the middle. Poi dopo. Little piping on the top. Sugar. Onto the top. And there you have it. Santa Rosa. Now this is the thing that makes it the Amalfi sfogliatelli. Napoli or Amalfi? Amalfi. Do you know what? I probably agree with him too. They're delicious. Buon appetito. Grazie. Italian food is some of my favorite, and the bakes I've tasted on this trip haven't disappointed. Now I want to celebrate Italy with a bake of my own, and this is the perfect spot to do it. Here I am in the middle of a Malfi town. 
I've worked in some places before. I reckon this one's got to be the most beautiful. I'm taking inspiration from this stunning location to make a Caprese cake, named after the island of Capri, which sits just off the Amalfi Coast. Andrea has kindly provided some local ingredients and agreed to help me out. Now this cake is celebrating all about Amalfi. For me, I'm going to use the chocolate which Andrea makes and I'm going to use almonds and lemons from Amalfi too. While Andrea chops some almonds, I start the cake mix by whisking sugar and egg yolks until pale and light. I'm trying to add a little bit of texture to this. So you've got lumps and pieces of almond and we're going to use ground almonds too. Now the almonds in Italy are some of the best. You can't just go and buy ground almonds, you have to do it yourself. It does smell different, if I'm honest. You get some blanched almonds, blitz it in your processor, and you'll end up with these beautiful, freshly made ground almonds. Now in here, I've been whisking the egg yolks and the sugar together. If you look at the, the texture, it's lovely and thick and creamy. Good, it's a good texture. But you should be able to do an eight, and it holds in the top. I add the ground almonds, the roughly chopped almonds, straight in, and the chocolate. The smell of the chocolate is incredible. Fold that mixture together. Next, I've whisked up the leftover egg whites. OK, so it holds on a whisk. And there's a technique to adding it to the mix. First of all, you only use a little bit, because if I put all of it in, it will lose all its air, it'll collapse back down. Just mix this in, slacken the mix down. Andrea, can you put the rest of it in there, please? Grazie. So there you have it. I think it's a good caprese. Eh? It smells delicious. Andrea, could you put that in the oven for me? At 180 for around 40 minutes. Grazie, Andrea. While Andrea's putting that in the oven, I might go and have a limoncello or two. Possibly three, but no more than four. Beautifully baked, my caprese cake is ready for decorating. OK, Andrea's baked it off, and this is how it comes out of the oven. We've turned it upside down to give you that gorgeous shape. We've got some beautiful lemons. Can I try some? I've never, never yes. tried some of this before. Yes, yes. Let me just try. Andrea's kitchen makes this candied lemon peel. The peel is boiled for 12 days in a sugar syrup. You can imagine how great it tastes. No good. Bellissimo. That is absolutely delicious. It's full of flavour. It's just the right tartness and sweetness together, the blend. And it's crispy. Oh, that's delicious. Absolutely. That's going to go really well with this cake. I ask Andrea to top off the cake with this incredible chocolate ganache icing. Oh, 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 yes. Look at that. OK. I think uh, it's perfect now. With our lemon. Grazie. So, a beautiful looking caprese cake, in keeping with this stunning setting. The Amalfi Coast has certainly made an impression on me, but can I impress the locals? They like it? Yes, yes. Good. It's OK. <laughs> It works. It's nice to sign off with a smile, but I'm sad that my voyage around the best of Neapolitan baking has come to an end. I've loved this place, the people and the pastries. Do you know what I love about Napoli and Amalfi, and in fact, all of Italy? You can sum it all up in one word. Whether it's for cars, buildings, food, bikes, anything in Italy, it's about passione. Passione. At least that's what I think they say. Passion. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, <laughs> the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb.
This time, I'm hitting the streets of the gastronomic capital of Scandinavia. This is Copenhagen. Home to some of the finest bakes in the Northern Hemisphere. That's impressive. I get hands-on with some Danish pastries and meet my match in a maverick master baker. It's too flat and wet. It's not, it's all right, honestly. Copenhagen's magical nightlife keeps me entertained. This is the inspiration for Disneyland. There goes me lunch. And I get a taste of Denmark's warm welcome. Are you okay? Absolutely. Let's go. This is my first time in Denmark's hip capital, Copenhagen. And I'm really looking forward to exploring it. Look at those beautiful buildings coming down there. It's colourful, buzzy and bike-friendly, with over nine centuries of history. Well, Copenhagen is a fishing village. That's what it's based on. And it's all about water. So water runs through this city like veins. I've always had an affinity with water. I was born and bred in and around the sea. It just floats my boat. Forget the cold, that's for wimps. People here embrace the outdoors. Wherever you go, you see these rugs hanging on the back of the chairs. You've got your heater, you've got your rug, you've got your nice warm coffee or hot chocolate. You just relax and watch the world go by. Copenhagen's home to some of my all-time favorite baking classics. From its wonderfully rich rye breads, which are hard to beat. Look at that, full of pumpkin seed. The flavor is intense, it really is. To one of my biggest passions, Danish pastries. Come here, come here, look at this here. Can I try one of these, please? Yeah. These look amazing, but I'm a little bit baffled by them. 30% wholemeal. Interesting. Thank you, yeah, lovely, thank you. It's like eating a really soft wholemeal roll with cinnamon and it's sweet with a beautiful chocolate on the top. That's impressive. <laughs> I'm definitely taking this idea back home with me. Thank you. Now, I'm not here just to eat Danish pastries. I'm here to meet Meta Blomsterberg, who apparently is the goddess of bacon in Denmark. Uh, Meta is an international award-winning pastry chef, a restaurateur, and a judge on Denmark's version of the Bake Off. I think we're going to get along famously. Meta. Hi. Hello. Nice meeting you. Hello, how are you? You all right? I'm so fine. Thank you for being my guide around Copenhagen. Meta's promised to show me how good food and a warm welcome are an essential part of the Danish culture. Everywhere you go, you're met with a smile and there's a real delight in sharing and enjoying great food and hospitality. Mm. Oh, wow. In fact, they've even got their own word for it. So this is the Danish hygge. Have you heard about the Danish hygge? No. No? It's just the, the feeling, you know, the, the things sitting together around the table, eating good food, you know, the coziness. Uh, I get that, but yeah. I didn't realise there was a name for it. And this is just a small taste. I need to show you a place. Oh, fantastic, Lido. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thank Hello. you. In the heart of Copenhagen, tucked down a side street, is the little unassuming lunchtime venue. Schunemann's has been welcoming hungry diners through its doors since 1877. Hi! Hi. Oh, John. Schunemann's is famous for specializing in Denmark's national dish, a lavish open sandwich loaded with delicious Nordic ingredients, built on top of a rich rye bread base. So you have never had smørbrød before? No, I haven't. How do you say that? First, smørbrød. Smørbrød. Yeah, there's the soft. A few snaps. Rye bread has been around for over 2,000 years, thanks to a quirk of fate when Scandinavian farmers found rye easier to grow than wheat. Originally the food of peasants, the smørbrød has recently been elevated to a kind of art form. Let's go. And it's traditionally washed down with local beer and a generous shot of schnapps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the 
is this the question? There are 104 versions of the Schmerbel to choose from, but we're starting with a classic combo with the finest matured pickled herrings, heaped with a fresh, crisp garnish. The rye bread is underneath. Yeah. And we have apple, onion. Exactly. Celery. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, capers. And some, um, some spices. You like it? That's delicious with the rye bread. Mm -hmm. The rye bread's got a, a sweetness to it to counter the vinegar of the herring. Mm -hmm. And then the creaminess of the sauce comes in. Mm -hmm. But the balance of the whole dish is neutral. Yeah. You've just got a nice flavor in your mouth. Yeah. And actually wash it all down with a little bit of ale. Mm. Cool. Now you smile. Let's go. I'm happy. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a pint me on. Well, half a liter. I'm Welcome so happy you wanted to join me here. <laughs> really? I'm not sure about the schnapps. Yes, you are. I'm not. <laughs> it's 40 percent. The Danes have a great saying. Lunch without snaps is breakfast. But before I build up the courage to drink mine, we're going to try another schmerbel. This time, we've gone for a fried herring. That's a more complex flavor. Yes. It's fattier, it's richer, because yes. I, I can feel it on my lips. Mm -hmm. It actually tastes like it's doing you good. Mm -hmm. And it is doing you good. The rye bread, which is the basic in this kind of lunch, is healthy. You digest rye bread better than you yes, do conventional yes, wheat. Yes. It, goes it goes into the body of farm. easier to your body, yeah. Of course, it's a good thing. The flavors are here. The ambiance, or the, the hygge, is here. <laughs> You've got that. I suppose it's like putting a comfortable pair of slippers on and a blanket around you and having a cup of tea with the fire on. Mm. That's fuga. You know what? We should go for the snaps now. <sighs> <laughs> Are you OK? Absolutely. Let's go. This is hygge. Right? Yeah, it will be in a minute. <laughs> Well, I've had a great day today, first day in Copenhagen. Bit of a boozy lunch, if I'm honest. But I've got one more treat. From Easter right through to Christmas, the city comes alive with a unique attraction that's been going strong since 1843. Welcome to Tivoli. Denmark's oldest and best loved theme park is more than just a fairground, it's a national treasure. Hello, sir. Hello. Welcome to Tivoli. Thank you. Step into Tivoli Gardens, it's like you've stepped into a fairy tale. What's weird is the city centre is right here. You're surrounded by buildings. And right in the heart of Copenhagen is this place. It's beautiful. Sometimes I wish I was seven again. It's got a real magical feel to it, this place. In fact, Walt Disney actually came here, and this was the inspiration for Disneyland. It's amazing. A visit to Tivoli Gardens wouldn't be complete without a go on its famous wooden roller coaster. Built in 1914, it's the only one of its kind in the world. There goes me lunch. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Next, I'm put to the test. 250 grams. OK. When I come up against the Danish pastry pro. Oh. I give public transport Copenhagen style a go. I'm loving that talk on this. And for my city bake, I team up with the doyen of Danish baking. Hello, Meta. Hello! I'm on an adventure to find the heart and soul of Copenhagen's baking culture. And I'm lapping up the warm welcome that the Danish call Huga. Let's go. But I couldn't come to the Danish pastry capital of the world without rolling up my sleeves to find out how the genuine article is made. It's cold. It's wet. I'm in the middle of Copenhagen. 
it's baking hours and I'm here to see the best Danish pastry Copenhagen has to make. Interesting. Pastry obsessed owner and baker Torben Sorensen got his first job in a bakery at the age of 16 and never looked back. When he bought St. Peter's in 2000, he was not only buying the oldest bakery in Copenhagen, but with it came its original recipes, including one that's become a massive hit. The Onslaid Snell, or Wednesday Snell to you and me, takes inspiration from the Viennese pastry tradition. Many have tried to imitate it, but this is where the real McCoy is made. Torben. Yeah, Torben. I've been warned that Torben has a fearsome reputation and really lets anyone into this inner sanctum. Okay, Torben, so I'm here to make Danish pastries, yeah? Yes. And this is your dough? Yes, my dough. You have eggs in this? Yes. Sugar, salt, flour, yeast? Yes. And then butter folded in? No. No butter folded in? No. <laughs> okay. That's going to be interesting. A traditional Danish pastry is built up layer by layer with butter spread in between. You put butter in the mix? Yes. Yeah. You don't fold it? No. Okay, so you don't do it the Austrian way? The Danish way. I'm interested to see how this affects the texture of his Danish mix. But first, Torben's putting me to work. You don't uh, want to see the bottom. Okay. So you're up to, up to there? Yeah. The secret ingredient that keeps Torben ahead of his competition is this amazing, sweet-smelling paste. And I'm trying to work out what's in it. Butter, sugar, cinnamon, syrup, and something else, I don't see. Torben's playing his cards very close to his chest. Taste it. All bakers are secretive about their recipes. My dad always said to me, son, always hold a pocket full of aces. So show people a lot of stuff, but never show them everything. Now for the construction. Rolling the dough into a five meter long sausage is no mean feat, especially in the presence of a fellow perfectionist. It's too uh, slapping, but it's, uh... it's not, it's all right, honestly. So is that. <laughs> <laughs> I make this to help you. Okay. And I thought I was a tough taskmaster. 250 grams. Okay. Oh. Oh. oh! oh, that one's a bit big. Oh, oh. Hang on, if I test some of those over there, what are they going to be like? They <laughs> I love the way Torben works because for me, he's like, he is like a kindred spirit. Fascinating guy. He starts work about half five, five o'clock. That's a bit of a lie in, if I'm honest. But he probably works there till about 11 o'clock at night. How many of these do you make in a day then? 1,000. 1,000? Yes. And you work on your own? Yeah. Why? Because uh, I know it's uh, okay every time. Yeah, but then you must be tired. No, I'm fresher than uh, I was before. There's a lot of character about it. You have to be slightly quirky, slightly skew. You see, ba I've been a baker for most of my life. I was Me too. 12 when I started. Yeah. Am I like that? Probably. I think you have to be to get out of bed in the morning. So actually, I understand. There is a lot to be saying about working on your own. With the first batch of Wednesday snails prepped, they're proved to give them their rise and then popped into the oven to bake. They should be coming out of the oven in about 10 minutes or so. Can't wait to try them. They smell delicious. The wafts of freshly cooked cinnamon are already drawing in a crowd. So I'm giving Torben a hand with the finishing touches. No sooner have these come out and the girls come in and start loading up the shop, they've gone. That's the culture of Danish pastries in Copenhagen. I like the boldness of these pastries. They've got a great buttery colour and they're massive yet surprisingly light. I'm dying to get stuck into one and see how Torben's maverick pastry mix has turned out. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. I got it. It is different. Yeah. Um, it, feel, it tastes to me more like um, an English Chelsea bun. Yeah. 
An English Chelsea bun has a little bit of cinnamon, mm -hmm. a few sultana, but dough only, not, yeah. not layers. Wow. Tastes good. I like that. I'm still stumped as to that secret ingredient though, but I couldn't think of a better way to start my day. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you're short one day and you need uh, help, you call me. Yeah. I'll come in and help you. I like that. Let's go. Let's go. There it is. I love this place. I love the passion. I love the way Torben bakes. And I know if I'm ever short of work, I'm knocking on his door. One of Copenhagen's most familiar sights are throngs of cyclists. With five bikes for every car, it's no wonder it's one of Europe's least polluted cities. If, like me, you're not too clever on a bicycle, then you can hire one of the 400 electric cars dotted around the city. And it's as simple as popping into a newsagent and picking up one of these cards. That worked then. Starting, but <laughs> normally when you start a car here, um, you start this, it just lights up. So, okay, I think we're good to go. Ooh, I'm loving that talk on this. The acceleration's amazing, and it's so quiet. I'm on my way to meet up with Meta, the queen of Danish baking. She's already introduced me to one of Denmark's classic dishes, but for my city bake, we're going to team up. When she's not writing books or appearing on Danish TV, Meta can be found hard at work crafting fine pastries. Hello, Meta. Hello! In the kitchen of a stylish cafe, Blomsterbergs. Well, I'm here in Meta's beautiful cafe, and we're going to make a Kranzerkaken. We're going to put a modern twist on this traditional Scandinavian celebration cake made from a tower of delicious stacked marzipan rings. So, to start with, yes? we have egg white, we have icing sugar, we have marzipan, and we have chopped pistachios. Mm -hmm. Right, OK. What are we going to do then? First of all, mash the, a little of the egg whites mm -hmm. together with the icing sugar. Yeah. And then, when it's mashed together, we put it together with the marzipan. Okay. And when it's such a small portion like this is, I would recommend that you just do it by hand on the table. Mash it together. together. Yes, yes. Super. So we're slackening this marzipan down now to make it a little bit thinner. Once the mix comes together, pop it in a bag and chill in the fridge for three quarters of an hour which makes it easier to handle when it comes out. So if you like marzipan, this is the dish for you. And traditionally, it's eaten New Year, like New Year, Christmas time. Yeah, but we also eat it every, uh, all year. OK. We make it as smaller cakes with some cream inside or with orange or anything, yeah. Next, roll the chunks of the marzipan mix into long sausages. Now here's the twist. So now I put it into the pistachio nuts. So it's just to coat the marzipan in the pistachio? Yeah. So if you can't get hold of the pistachio nuts, use hazelnuts, mm -hmm. use ground almonds, mm -hmm. and again, you get that same, same, same finish. Or you can make it just naked as, as it is. This is. Yeah, yeah. Another roll just beds those pistachios into the marzipan. It's quite therapeutic, this, actually. It's don't push down with marzipan. Literally, it's the weight of your hand. Go from the tip mm -hmm. down to the heel of your palm and roll gently all the way along, it's yeah, nice, yeah. And all the same width. Apply some pressure on the strips to flatten them slightly, which will help them form in the rings. Cut the strips into ever-increasing lengths, starting at eight centimetres. Two centimetres is the growth on each one. So the reason why it goes up in two centimetres is basically because each ring is going to get slightly bigger and bigger and bigger. So that was 18, so this is uh, 20. You're a clever guy. Thank you. <laughs> Starting with the smallest, shape the strips into rings. The more you make, the bigger the tower. 
And how big have you made? I have made it for 28 rings. Wow. But of course, the rings on the bottom, they really need to bake a little extra, because they need They're to... They're going to carry all that weight. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget a large marble-sized ball for the top. OK, so you've made sure each of the rings are nice and round, flatten them down slightly so they're going to sit on top of each other nicely, bake them off about 190, 195 on fan for around 10 minutes, and they'll come out beautiful and lightly brown. Mm -hmm. Right, in they go. Once the marzipan rings have cooled, for that extra special touch, dip the base of each ring into melted chocolate and start to stack. It's beautiful, Paul. I think it looks amazing already, but Met has gone the extra 10K on this one and made some fancy baked marzipan swirls to decorate it. And now, the final touches. Beautiful. And then, some Danish flags. And there you have it. You don't have to put Danish flags on it. No, you can put of British course not. British flags on it. Of course, and it's also very nice and just small parts. You can bake small parts in the oven and dip them in chocolate. It's so good for coffee and tea. So that's Hugo. That's Hugo. Remember the candle lights. Thank that's you fine. for helping me here in the kitchen. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. Make it yourself now. <laughs> what a monumental way to end my tour of Copenhagen. I've fallen in love with Copenhagen, actually. It's one of those places that you feel at home straight away. The food here is beautiful. It's simple, it tastes good, and it's full of flavor. But it is all about Huga. Huga is Copenhagen. I love it. I just love it. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, <laughs> the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid back sunshine vibe of Miami to the European chic of Paris. I'm on my global tour of baking, and today I'm here to sample the delights of Madrid. This time on City Bakes, I'm put through my paces making a local delicacy. It's like driving a bus that's burst all its tires. I discover the secret of puff pastry the Madrid way. Look at the layers. And I create a city bake that you can bake at home. I'm gonna nick this recipe, let me tell you. <laughs> the British love Spain. Every year, over 12 million of us hit the beaches here in search of the sun. Hello. Hello. And judging by my welcome, Thanks. Thanks so much. Have a great one. I've seen you on the telly. It looks like Madrid is a popular city destination too. Cheers, Paul. But believe it or not, I've never been here before. So I'm looking forward to exploring this beautiful city. I love this. Look at that. That is beautiful. The Roman church in the background, the beautiful buildings going all the way down, the perspective that lines up. Yeah, I, can, I could sit, having went to art school, I could sit here and paint that all day. That's exceptional. Madrid is one of Europe's sunniest capitals. And when you live in a climate like this, it's no surprise that eating and drinking outdoors becomes a way of life. You see tables and chairs all over the place, people eating outside, enjoying the outdoor life. And that's what it's all about, really, for me. There wasn't much of this cafe culture where I grew up in Liverpool. I could definitely get used to this, but I don't know much about Madrid's baking culture. When you think of Spanish cooking and Spanish food, you think of tapas, you think sangria, you think chorizo, you think paella. But 
I'm digging around to find out a little bit more about what makes Spanish, and more in particular, Madrid, tick in the baking world. Luckily, I know just the person. My old buddy, Omar Alaboy, is the owner of a UK chain of tapas restaurants. Hi there, buddy. Oh. <laughs> but has spent most of his life in Madrid. This is the, uh, the place that I used to come with my mum time and time again. I've probably tried every single pastry a million times. Omar's brought me to El Rio Hanna, which was established in 1855 by the pastry chef to the Spanish queen. The counter is rammed full of delicious looking pastries, biscuits and cakes. Nos puedes dar a probar, por favor? He's gonna give us a little taste. No wonder Omar spent so much time here when he was a lad. I think I would have done the same. From cream-filled buñuelos, a sort of mini donut. That's beautiful. To rows of sweet biscuits. Wow, nuts coming through. That's sweetness from a caramel as well. Many of these are made with lard instead of butter. Beautiful. <laughs> That's a dunker as well. Yes. All right, now it's like six dunks and a cup of coffee, that one. These bakes are so full of flavor. No, it tastes good. <laughs> My first taste of Madrid baking is turning into one treat after another. Wow, I love that. I'm gonna have to take some of these home, I know I am. <laughs> Religion plays an important part in Spanish baking. In fact, most of these bakes are made to celebrate religious festivals of one sort or another. It is religion, again, dominating baking again. So certain times of year they produce something to celebrate Always. a saint or a, a season. Always, and the nuns in the convents. Still, uh, they do the best biscuits, the best pastries in the country. I just picture nuns sitting there, actually, I mean, in black, covered in flour, <laughs> and producing biscuits and, yeah. and baked. <laughs> For me, tasting the pastries and the biscuits have been amazing. What I did find fascinating, though, was the the religious connotations in the baking, the way that seasonally certain things are baked at certain times of year. And then when you look at the variety in there, you know you're in a very special place. Gracias. Hasta luego. Something I love almost as much as baking is biking. This is the perfect way to see Madrid. It's a beautiful city with a stylish mix of the old and the new. I could spend all day taking in the sights, but I'm here to learn about the bakes. So Omar is taking me to another historic bakery with a reputation for a very special religious cake. Tucked away in these narrow back streets is the oldest pastry shop in Madrid, Pastelaria del Pozo. I love the look of the shop. This is like a kid's toy shop. <laughs> it's amazing. I think when you look at it, for me, it's about, it's about the colour. You know, sometimes you go to bakeries and they're quite pale. This has got lots of colour. It's got that old school feel. Yeah, look at the cashier, how old it is. That's probably wow. over 100 years, I'm guessing. Right, let's get in. I'm down to try some of this stuff. Looks good. Hola. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Muy bien. Fantastic looking place. The bakes that you have in there, I mean, they look beautiful. Thank you. And what, what are you famous for? Bath pastry and roscon. Roscon de Reyes, which means king's ring, is a religious bake typically eaten after Christmas to celebrate the arrival of the three wise men. The orange blossom in there as well. Yeah. Yes. And lemon. A Spanish and lemon. orange blossom. Mm. Mm, it's been a long time. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Spectacular. <laughs> it is a cross between a cake and a bread. I'm like, it is. Yeah. Yes. You make literally a bread dough and a cake dough combined. So a sponge gets mixed with a fermented dough? Correct. Takes time to make this. It tastes amazing. The whole place for me is just magical. I love going into places like this. And you can really taste the atmosphere as soon as you walk in. This bakery has a reputation for its puff pastry. And there's something else in the window that has caught my eye. An empanada is a stuffed pastry which dates from medieval times, when the Spanish took their inspiration from the Indian samosa. Look at the layers there. See all those beautiful layers and the filling? And so thin as well. That's done with the lard and 
Absolutely. And even though that Lord. it's lard and no butter, it, it still looks really golden and yellow. And you would think that lard will make it whiter, but it doesn't. Mm. How delicate is that? Wow. Wow. That's delicious. I mean, really good. That's sensational. Better than pizza. Mm. <laughs> oh, it's a shame we don't live down the road. <laughs> if I lived here, I'd be bigger than I am. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That is very special. Yeah. I've tried a lot of puff pastry in my time, but one made with lard, really? But when you eat it, you feel almost each layer as you bite into it with your teeth, and then it just melts on your tongue. I've got to see how they make this. Hola. Hola. Ah, panada. Angel has been working at Potho for an incredible 45 years. No wonder he's learned a thing or two about making puff pastry. So what he's actually doing is putting the lard on, which I've never actually seen before. Now, it's this melted lard. It's warm, so it's liquids, which is going on top of the pastry. Now, this is on... It's cold. It's very cold. Está frío, sí. When I make puff pastry, I keep the pastry cold by putting it in a fridge. But Angel uses a tray of ice. So he's chilling it down, brushing it on while it's hot, leaving it to set, and then he's going to fold it. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I'd hardly believe it. And just to prove it's true, Angel's got the evidence. Ah, there's the fat. The this fat. is this is the lard. I mean, look at it. It feels like. It feels like. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's 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 proper lard. Angel rolls and folds his lard-filled pastry to create those all-important layers. The more layers that you put into this, the more it puffs up in the oven. It's got no rising agents in it at all, and the flavour, kid you not. It's spectacular. Look at that. Look at the layers. With lard. I've actually learned something. I never knew that you could produce the layers almost like a proper puff pastry, but just made with lard. It's incredible. Gracias, chef. Del Pozo has been in business for over 180 years, and now I know why. Simply delicious. I've tried a lot of bakes in my time, and what I've learned today and there, I am going to take that with me for the rest of my life. I'm now beginning to understand what Madrid baking is all about. Coming up, I sample Madrid's supersized baking tradition. Look at the size of the jewels. It's like that. And I take inspiration from the local baking culture with my own city bake. It's perfect. Well done, it does taste of Spain. I'm in Madrid, discovering the best of Spanish baking. I don't like it. I love it. And enjoying the sights and sounds of the city. What a place to live. It's my first visit to Madrid, but I feel very at home here. I love parts of the city that are like this. I particularly love. It's the, it's the way the buildings are almost on top of each other. Very characteristic of cities around Europe, where it almost joins together. And then the architecture, you look around, the balconies are pretty, the colors are amazing. And what seems to be all over the place in Madrid are these tiles, these painted tiles, which I think are gorgeous. I mean, I'd have that in my loo, if I'm honest. But then you look at this, again, the same here. You've got these beautiful pictures. It's very artistic. But then it's, you really feel that you've stepped back two, three hundred years. I love cities like that. The feel of the, the road, cobbles, lots of people. And to be honest, everyone I've met in Madrid have been fantastic, really friendly. Want to show you the city, and they're very proud of the city. It's beautiful. The Spaniards have a reputation for staying up later than everyone else. They've even given the early hours of the morning its own name, La Madrugada. And Madrid has a favorite pastry dish to eat after a night out. It's called Chocolata con Churros. Omar's actually recommended this place. This is called San Gines, and apparently it's the best chocolate in Madrid. 
and I love chocolate. Okay, there's a bit of a queue. This is a popular place, and it's a pretty spot too. When you look around, I mean, the settings, I mean, look at, look over here. Look at that. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Beautiful old building. You really feel you're in this. I'm losing my place. <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, uh, it's just buzzing. And everyone's really excited about getting chocolate. It's like the massive Willy Wonka factory. The chocolate is served piping hot with the churros, which is a deep fried dough, a bit like chew pastry. The smell of chocolate is intoxicated. Look at the size of the churros. Massive like that. Nice. Gracias. Look at these fellas. They're perfect. Wow. The smell. The smell is fantastic. I'm just going to have a quick taste of it on its own. Quite salty. And the texture is quite open inside. So it's quite an open texture, but it melts in the mouth. It's not a bad flavour just on its own. That chocolate is something else. <laughs> it's spectacular. The silkiest, smoothest chocolate that you've ever had. And that's all these guys selling here. And it's absolutely rammed and there's queues about a mile down the road. That's spectacular. I've just got to know how they make this now. Us bakers are an understanding bunch, so I'm sure they won't mind me having a nose behind the scenes. Hola. In the kitchens, I find the bakers pounding a simple mixture of salt, water and flour, and that's it. No butter and no eggs, but plenty of elbow grease. It's a strange mix. It's very, very hard. It is like a hot water crust pastry. Very difficult to work with. OK, he's putting on the, the piper now. Mixing the dough suddenly feels like the easy bit. <laughs> that looks difficult, if I'm honest. That looks really difficult. Jeez. Wow. OK. <laughs> this isn't like any piping bag I've ever used before. It's really weird. It's really weird. Yeah, I think it's a good pattern, this one. I think I've invented something here. It's like driving a bus that's burst all its tires. <laughs> I mean, that's what the mints look like. Beautiful concentric circles going in. I think mine's a new one, to be honest. Um, I think it's probably going to sell quite well. The dough was certainly mixed to perfection. From the sublime to the ridiculous. Yeah. I like to call it puzzlement. I'm more used to being the judge, but now it's my turn to be judged. That's good, eh? <laughs> no offence taken, but never mind how it looks. How does it taste? It tastes beautiful. I don't know what he's talking about. He doesn't have a clue. It's beautiful. Try it. Try it. Might not look good, but it tastes amazing. <laughs> I'm gonna have some more. I've loved my visit to San Ginés. The chocolate is delicious, and I'm happy to leave the churros to the experts. But before I leave this wonderful city, I want to mark my visit with a bake of my own. I've got a recipe in mind, but I'm going to need some ingredients. Now, this is the place I've come to find. This is San Miguel Market. It was refurbed totally in 2009, one of the oldest iron markets still left in Madrid. And apparently, the food in here is fantastic. This place is full of the best of Spanish produce, all of which you can enjoy as tapas at one of the counter bars, which seem to be doing a roaring trade. 
feels alive, this place, full of food. The smells as well, you can smell the ham. I can smell frying as well. Great looking pastry though. Believe me, I could eat my way around this place no problem, but I'm here to find the ingredients for my city bake, which I've decided is going to be my own twist on an empanada. First on my list is cheese. Well, I mean, when I think of queso, I mean, the cheese here is beautiful. Manchega I've used a lot in bread and pastries and it's delicious. This looks stunning. I love Manchego. It's a buttery cheese named after the Manchego sheep that graze La Mancha, an elevated plateau south of Madrid. Aged for a full two years, this cheese will be rich in flavor. Manchego. Gracias. Gracias. Next on my shopping list is ham, and I've come to the right place. Spain is the home of Hamon Iberico, from the free-range pigs that roam Spain's oak forests and are fed on acorns and grain. I mean, look at this ham. It's just stunning. This is what Iberico ham is all about. Also known as pata negra, this meat is matured for up to three years and is some of the best I've ever eaten. That's delicious. That is going in my empanada. It's going to taste amazing. There's so many local delicacies to tempt shoppers here. I love it. And you might have noticed that I'm a soft touch when it comes to tasty treats. I think I've broken a tooth. Delicious, though. Filled with mouth-watering flavors and aromas, the Mikado has a really great atmosphere. It's the ideal setting for me to do my bake. I'm going to make my interpretation of an empanada. Now, I've got Omar here, and I hope he likes it. The flavors that I've chosen have been influenced from what I've seen, actually, over the last few days. The pastry is loosely based on the technique and the empanadas we saw at Povi, Povo. El Pozo's Pasteleria. That place. <laughs> now, I'm going, to, I'm going to make a pastry. It's like a rough puff pastry. My base dough is made with plain flour, salt, and water. Normally, I'd just use butter to layer the dough. But just as they did at Del Pozo, this time, I'm adding the best quality pork lard. Now, I'm going to fold that over, and again, put the rest of the lard on. Now, what is it about this lard that makes it so good? Well, Iberico pigs, they are a different breed that roam freely. And as you know, most of the flavor in meat is in the fat. And that's why Iberico ham is that good. Hence, the lard is that good, and it gives so much character and so much flavor to the pastry itself. I mean, the flavor that we had in the empanada in the bakery was just stunning. Yeah. I mean, that's why I've used it in this. I fold and roll the dough three times. Then I'm ready to add the filling. I've got some spinach here, which I'm just going to lay in the middle. Would you mind cutting up some of those peppers? Yes, absolutely. Now, I've bought some manchego. The actual cheese itself is so potent, it's full of flavor. It's just incredible. On goes that melt in the mouth of Berico ham. Now, that's basically it. Get your lid and just fold it over the top. Get your egg wash, loads of that on there. Now, you know where the oven is, don't you? Yes. I'll leave that with you. Brilliant. You can take that for me. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. 180, 20 minutes? I would say 200, 15, 20 minutes. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. The whole thing about empanadas now is the bake. What we're looking for is that layers, the rise, the puff-ups. So as the fat melts, it pushes steam up between those very thin layers that we've achieved. I just hope he likes it. My Madrid-inspired empanadas certainly look the part. The Iberico lard in the pastry has really worked. Let me cut a, a little bit. Oh, look Flaky. at that crumble. We're getting a How great, flake great flake in there. full of flavor. I'm going to need this recipe, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> These empanadas really are so simple and easy. But the Iberica lard has really lifted them. Like the pastries I've tasted in Madrid, they're crunchy and rich, but still light. Well done, that's taste of Spain. <laughs> You know the bacon in Paris is good. We all know that. Same in Germany, same in Italy, same in Greece. Pride knew nothing of Madrid. They're really enthusiastic and celebrate their food. 
The baking here is some of the best I've ever seen and I will definitely be coming back and hopefully so will you. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Billy in search of the people, the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. in Warsaw. Now, I've never actually been to Poland before, but I'm here to check out the baking culture of this former communist state. I meet up with the queen of Polish patisserie with a unique take on cake. So you get big woman, small woman. Woman, this is a little bit... Hmm? Yeah. And this is a little bit more slim. <laughs> I find a home away from home in a former communist canteen. You're a good chef. Will you be my mother? Ah, uh, <laughs> And for my city bake... There we go. Lovely. Look at those fellas. I'm raising the bar by putting a modern spin on a Polish classic. They look fantastic. My journey to find the best of world baking has brought me to Poland's capital city of Warsaw. I love it. I love the vibe of this place. It's a complex city where reminders of Warsaw's communist past loom large alongside the pretty fairy tale streets of the old town. This is the almost the showstopper of Warsaw. This is the main marketplace. Well, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Warsaw has withstood anything history could throw at it and during the Nazi occupation was almost brought to its knees. 85% of Warsaw was flattened during the Second World War. Since then, it's all been rebuilt and rebuilt based on pictures and photographs of the old town. When you look at all these old lamps, it looks like a Victorian thing. It's not, it's 60 years old. Despite its old world charm, Warsaw is a forward-looking city. In fact, Poland's economy has never been stronger. Warsaw now is a cool, funky city. I say cool, it is absolutely breezing. It's minus seven degrees today, but one thing that's always guaranteed to warm me up is sampling the delights of the city's baking culture, like this iced donut with rose petal jam. Now that is unusual and quite popular in Poland. But I can't hang around eating donuts all day. I've got an important date. I'm meeting Magda Kessler, a TV chef and a national treasure, who's been hailed as the queen of Warsaw patisserie. She apparently makes the most exquisite cakes and pastries. Let's see what they like, shall we? Magna's made a name for herself by putting traditional Polish cakes back on the menu. She's updated recipes and injected a dollop of flamboyant fun, making the classics cool again. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? And just like her, Magda's <laughs> cakes are big on creativity and even bigger on personality. The first one is this one. OK. It's babka. Babka. Babka is woman. So babka, you'd say that was a woman? <laughs> yes, it's woman. OK, because it's round, it's the way it's... OK, fair it's enough, we won't go any further. Have everything. The babka is the granddam of Polish cakes and translates as grandmother because of its shape that resembles the pleats of a lady's skirt. There's lots of versions of the theme, but this one's a classic, smothered in almonds and fruit. And it's very, very fresh. Oh, yes, it is. It's very regular, but it's very, mm, you know that. It looks I great. Mm, it's done. Lots of flavor in there. Orange, but uh, 
fried. Mm. No, no, no fresh. It's orange skin. Ah, and you fry it off. It's fried in the sh sugar syrup. Nice. You've got that citrus going through, you've got the fruit going, you've got nuts. It's like... In the it's year. like me. It is like you. OK. It's, it's very sweet. Um, lots going on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Magda's babka has hit the spot. Now for her next choice. We're going from the matronly to the miniature. Small babka. <laughs> I love the way you relate all cakes to women. So you get woman. big woman, small woman. Woman, this is a little bit. Hmm? Yeah. And this is a little bit more slim, more <laughs> younger. <laughs> totally bonkers, but I love it. This little lady's looks are deceiving. I thought it had a pastry crust, but it's actually sponge. Got the yellow in that. The yellow is fantastic. That comes from the eggs, it comes from the butter but it tastes so good, it is, and it does melt in the mouth. Very different to the first babka. I couldn't come to Magda's without trying her poppy seed cake, an Eastern European speciality crammed with ground poppy seeds, nuts and dried fruits, and a world away from the paler Western versions that I'm used to. This would be fascinating. Wow, the flavour is intense. Very. It's a strong flavour. You get sweetness, but not too much. It's a perfect combination. But then you get the poppy seed coming through. I love poppy seed anyway. Poppy seed on like, anything's gorgeous. But poppy seed in this is soft. And then there's a light crunch in there as well. That is a bit like a Christmas cake. Wow. But better. <laughs> that is delicious. That, for me, encapsulates what Polish baking is about. Magda has built up a great business here for herself with cakes as good as you get anywhere in Europe. But there was a time when it wasn't possible to set up shop in the streets of Warsaw. During Poland's four decades of communist rule, if you weren't eating at home, you were probably in a bar Malechna or milk bar. And a handful of these subsidized canteen style kitchens can still be found in the city today. Hello. And for one good reason. Right. If you know what you're ordering, they offer hearty home-style canteen food that's popular with everyone, from pensioners to students. OK. I'm getting leady and I don't know what the hell I'm eating. And it all costs next to nothing. And I, I pay here? I pay here. Ah, okay. Ah, thank you. Ah, OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of oh, three pounds. This is obviously the heart of the operation, the main kitchen. It reminds me of a cafe I used to go to when I was a kid. I like it. It's got an earthiness to it. It's like loads of mums feeding me food. I think it's a good thing. It smells coming from there, though, are incredible. My three pounds has bought me what looks like beetroot soup, some dumplings, a cabbage dish, and a lovely cup of tea. Do you have any milk? Milk, aha. Uh -huh. Aha! Milk with tea, obviously. It's slightly ironic to have to ask for milk in a milk bar. So called because of the number of dairy items on the menu, although there's plenty of other traditional dishes too. It is beetroot soup. Vegetables in there, beetroot in there. It's warm, seasoned beautifully. I like that. Wow. Now this is the cabbage. It's fried cabbage. A little bit of stock. Lots and lots of flavour in there. Quite pungent in flavour. Good for you. But again, everything everything that's on this plate is basically functional to keep you going. It's nutritional. You've got the beetroot, you've got the cabbage. Over here, you've got the dumplings, which I think it's got meat inside it. Let me have a look. It's like an unbaked empanada. Oh, they're lovely. If I stuck that in the fryer and eat it, you'd swear you were in Spain. It is amazing. It's, it's, it's like stepping back in time in here. 
and you get that feeling of communism in here, and I haven't had that before since I've been in Warsaw. Reflective as well. It does make you think. One of the reasons this place has stayed true to itself is thanks to owner, Jemima Bukowski, who for the past 27 years has been rustling up good, honest Polish fare, like this traditional fried pancake. You're a good chef. Will you, will, will you be my mother? <laughs> well, that was my little taste of communist food. It was nutritional, it was warm, it does the job. And you need it when it's that cold outside. Now I've got to brave the elements again. Next, I'm time traveling through Warsaw's baking past. Wow, that, that's incredible, that. My dad used to work on something like this. And into the future with Poland's most visionary patisserie. What we have done is deconstructed a traditional Polish cake. The whole thing together is a work of art. My baking adventure has brought me to Poland's capital, Warsaw, a city of contrast from indulgent rich cakes to good, honest communist staples. I'm discovering a whole new world of baking. <laughs> it's early evening in Warsaw, and most people are heading home. But for some, the working day is just beginning. The darkness is always the time for a baker to go to work. Now, this bakery is very special. It's been around for a long, long time, makes some of the best bread in Warsaw and apparently they've got an oven that dates back many, many years, and I can't wait to see it. Pia Karina Pivonski Bakery is as authentic as they come. Robert Pivonski's father opened this family-run business in 1955. We're coming now with bakery. And incredibly, it's hardly been modernised since. Just follow me. I love traditional bakeries, having grown up with my dad's in the 70s, but this is the real deal. Most of this equipment dates back to pre-World War II, and for an enthusiast like me, it's geek heaven. You see, this for me is the heart of the operation. This is where the mixing of the dough happens, the moulding, the shaping of the dough, and the rising of the dough slowly before it goes into the oven. But you can smell the flour. Robert and his team supply 100 shops across the city with some of the finest Polish breads. From Holka, a braided egg loaf, to the horseshoe brioche, Rogalik, and all with the help of these faithful machines. This is a very old mixer, isn't it? Exactly, yes, the mixer, the mixture is obviously from the beginning of the 20th century. Wow, that, that's incredible, that. My dad, yes, my dad used to work on something like this. Like very this. similar, uh -huh. yeah. But it was a it's artifacts a, mixer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just mixes yes. like this. Uh -huh. This place is like a working museum, and the mother of all ovens thought to be the oldest in Warsaw, is at the heart of the operation. As soon as I walked in, I knew that was very special. I, I want to go and have a look at Can I go and see this yes, Of course, please. Uh, you would like to try? I would like to have a go, yeah. I've never seen anything quite like this before. It kicks out a fearsome amount of heat, but I can't wait to get stuck in. It's OK. These? Yes. Pass them up to you. Uh, OK. Oh, they go. Oh, I see. So why do you put it from this oven to that oven? Because here uh, it, the temperature is too high in this in this cave. Okay. It's a good temperature for beginning, you know, but not for for finishing uh, baking. Okay, okay. So basically, the oven in there stings the bread, kills the yeast, and then it goes into the top one to dry out and finally bake. How long have these ovens been here, Robert? The, the oven is second-hand construction, you know. So the construction was from the 1930s, 1940s, I think. It was during the 40s when Poland was under German occupation that Robert's father first discovered his love of baking. During the war, he had to uh, hide from Germans uh, in the bakery because uh, he was sentenced to death by the German authorities. 
Wow. You're in occupation. <laughs> so your dad became a baker because he was hiding from the, from the Germans at the time. Wow, that's incredible. It's humbling to think what Robert's dad must have gone through, but inspiring all the same to see his legacy living on. Believe me, that's hard work. There must be 500, 600 loaves in there, bringing them all out with a peel from there to there and then out again. That's hard work, but worth it. You end up with a great quality product at the end of it. This is what baking is all about. It's my last day in Warsaw, and for my city bake, I'm heading to the ultra-chic cafe Adet, a place that's been redefining Polish patisserie. See what I mean? Look at these, these are top end. The man behind these intricate works of art is perfectionist and head chef, Jarek Nowakowski. Hello, Jarek. Hello. You're right. Nice to see you. Yarek's single-minded obsession with cake excellence has resulted in some world-class bakes. What we have done is uh, we have deconstructed a traditional Polish cake. We have a cheesecake, yeah. which is baked. We have poppy seed cake, which is massive over Christmas. So we wanted to include all the flavors that go into it, mm -hmm. but so you could get basically a better visual effect. Well, you can. The whole thing together is a work of art and taste. Absolutely. In fact, they taste as good as they look, if I'm honest. That poppy seed cake has got me itching to get to work. For my city bake, Yarek and I are going to create baking perfection by putting a modern twist on a great Polish classic. OK, so what we're going to do is basically a babka, aren't we? A babka, yeah. Now, it's just basically a sponge which we're going to bake in these little dinky tins. Traditionally, a babka is a sweet yeast leavened cake with raisins. But we're going to mix it up a bit. We're starting off as you would a basic sponge. Firstly, in goes the softened butter, then add to that castor or granulated sugar and mix together. Next, gradually start to add the eggs. So we carry on mixing this together and you can see the consistency is quite soft. See? Now, I'm happy with that. Now, basically, the next thing I'm going to add is some flour. Now, this has got baking powder in it. You want glucose, glucose in Glucose first, Now, yeah. this is unusual. Why do you put glucose in there? It's just a little secret that I actually uh, picked it up in France from an old baker. It helps to maintain the moisture within the cake. And uh, also, the, the, the mixture becomes a little bit more elastic, and we don't put as much sugar. OK. Next. Add the plain flour and baking powder and mix together. Okay. Now we've got something which is uh, fairly interesting. We've got a toasted, desiccated coconut. Yeah, no, that uh, is interesting. And that goes very well with lemon. And I mean, that's, that's a lot of coconut, though, isn't it? That's a lot of coconut, yeah. yeah. I mean, it turns out like a coconut cake rather than a babka. <laughs> No, it's babka, just with a twist. <laughs> OK, we give that a mix together, so we That's end up it, with yeah. a mix Looking out. good, looking it good. It looks pretty nice. Nice, shiny, smooth. Now, we've got some cream there. Is this we double cream? cream? Double cream, can be whipping cream. OK. Uh, we just add it last. Right. We mix this together and you end up with, with a beautiful lemon. dropping consistency like that. Now, we're going to add some zest. lemon zest and lemon lime, lime zest. zest. Now, you normally weigh this up, don't you? I do, yeah. Now, I used to do that many, many moons ago. And then the problem is, people at home, they couldn't be bothered weighing up zest <laughs> because most of their measurements don't go to that small. <laughs> so, to be honest, use two, the zest of two lemons and the zest of two limes in there, basically. Basically. This needs sharpening, mate. It's a bit blunt. <laughs> it's a fine microblade. <laughs> Isn't well, it? I, no, no, no. To be honest, we have chosen that just so you don't get to zest the pith. Yeah. Just so you get only the skin? I don't want to, I don't want to take the pith. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. 
So what I've got in there is the zest. I'm just going to fold that in. So you end up with, I mean, it smells lovely, that coconut and that lime. OK, go on. <laughs> you can get your hands dirty. So what we're going to do is put this mixture in these little tins here. We need uh, scales. Are you going to weigh, you're actually going to weigh this up? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Yarek's been super meticulous. But for mere mortals like you and me, just put a thin layer of mixture into the tin. And then for an authentic Polish touch, we're adding a layer of traditional rose petal jam. A little bit, just drop it all the way down. Yeah, that's it. OK, so we've got a little bit of rose jam in the middle. Jam. So now the a little bit more sponge on the top. Yeah. So when we bake it, we've got that beautiful little bit of rose in the yeah. middle. Lovely. So. Okay, there's one more thing I would like to do. Okay. I've got a little bit of oil, mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna score them. That's a nice little touch. Obviously, you don't have to do this at home. This is just emphasizing that when it cracks, it ensures that the crack actually happens in the middle and not to the side and balloons the whole cake up. So we're going to pop our perfectly filled mini tins into a fan oven on about 160 C for 35 minutes. There you go. Lovely. Look at those fellas. Now all that's left is a few finishing touches. Paint a lemon icing glaze on the top, about 200 grams of icing sugar to 25 grams of lemon juice. A little bit of lemon and grate that onto the top. Oh, look at that. And finally, Yarek's immaculate yellow macaron complements the lemon peel and that is cake perfection. They look fantastic. But the last thing I want to do, really, is try a little piece. Oh, oh look at that texture. Smell that coconut, can't you? Lovely. It's beautiful. It's got that coconut in. It's got the lemon in there. You can taste a little bit of lime in there as well. It's got a lovely texture, a nice sponge. Thank you, Yarek. Thank you for letting me use your kitchen. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Pleasure. That was marvellous. When I came to Warsaw, I was expecting dark, dingy, not much going on, a bit grey, repressed. Is that the right word? But I couldn't have been more wrong. It's a colourful place, big on personality, steeped in history, and its baking is superb. It draws inspiration from its past, but it's also looking ahead. The future of Polish baking is very, very bright. I think it's a very, very cool city, and I will definitely be back. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bielissimo. In search of the people, the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. City Bakes has taken me to some amazing cities all over the world, but I think I've arrived in Party Central. This place has got a buzz about it. This place is alive. This place is vibrant. This place is Miami. This time on City Bakes, I taste the local delicacies. Honestly, it's absolutely stunning. Inspired by a local classic, I bake a key lime pie you can bake at home. Lime is one of those flavours that just floats my boat, big style. And it's game day in Miami. It's a real family day out, and I love that. Where there's a typically warm welcome. All Hollywood City Base, welcome to Miami. I'm starting my journey in the heart of Miami, 
in the place it's most famous for, South Beach. This is Ocean Drive, basically all the way down here, you've got bars to the left, all the way down, and then you have the sea, which is all over there. And over there, actually, is Muscle Beach, which, obviously, I go there all the time. Miami was built as the holiday resort of the United States of America. Since the 1920s, the rich and famous have flocked here to see and to be seen. Look at that. That's the glitz and glamour of Miami. Everything is done for maximum effect. Look at those buildings up there. This is Art Deco. This is the 1920s, 1930s. This is when Miami really started to build down these drives. So that's why all the buildings are Art Deco and they're beautiful. These streets have the largest concentration of Art Deco buildings in the US. It's a tropical sort of heat here most of the year round. So the people are used to this sort of heat and then they develop most of the food and the drink around the weather. Miami is a city virtually built on the beach, so it comes as no surprise that the seafood here is incredible. Joe's Stone Crab has been a Miami institution since the early 20s, and I love crab, so there's no way I'm giving this a miss. Look at that. You don't get this stone crab in the UK at all, indigenous to here. Honestly, it's absolutely stunning. With the lime, it's to die for, I promise you. That's the best crab I've ever had in my life. It's worth coming to Miami just to have the crab. <laughs> that is stunning. Being an inquisitive kind of guy, I ask if head chef Andre can take me into the heart of the crab kitchen. The crabs are pre-cooked and chilled, and just the claws arrive ready to be freshly cracked open for service. It's, it's the way that these guys are doing it. Look at the way you do it. He knows exactly the pressure to put on to crack those shells. Oh. This may be harder than it looks. <laughs> it's quite a job, actually, because each one's slightly different. But it's finding that right balance of... It is. You get that rice it? crack. I managed to crack and that two. Going. So when they're doing this, how many of these will they go through in a the night? They'll go through about 1,500, 2,000 pounds a night. Wow. And it's, it's just a rhythm. It's, it's, it's a magical sound yeah. of just crack, 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 crack all night long. You know the restaurant's harming really well. There's more to this restaurant than the stone crab. They also serve a classic local bake that's been on the menu here for generations. Hi, sir. Thank you very much indeed. And general manager Brian is keen for me to try their key lime pie. Fantastic. I've got to try this. You're going to like it. It's made with Florida Key Limes, rumoured to be the sharpest of all limes. Do you know what it is? It's when your cheeks suck in because it's that tart. So that's what it should be. That is absolutely delicious. And a hint of sweetness in there just to finish that palate off, yeah. especially after the stone crabs. Yeah, I agree. I love key lime pie. I've forgotten, actually, before I came to my area, how much I love it. That's very good. I love this place. Thank you, Brian. There is nothing like rediscovering a favorite bake to make you fall in love with a city. Miami has many different sides to it. Ocean Drive is all about fitness, rollerblading, segways, chilling out on the beach. But at night, a whole different Miami emerges. The Art Deco buildings light up in neon as people go out to eat. There is another side I want to explore, Miami's Cuban community. This part of Miami is called Little Havana. There's a reason for that. You only have to look around to see all the different shops. The music you can hear as well as you go past some of the bars. Cuba is only 100 miles off the coast, and Cubans have been settling here since the 1950s. So, today, nearly a million and a half call Miami home. Nadal Ahmad is a local and the founder of the Pincho factory chain of restaurants, and he has agreed to show me around. So this is really the epicenter of Cuban and Hispanic culture here in South Florida. I think it's amazing. You know, you move from one part of Miami to another, and then you get a different vibe again. It, it's like you've gone somewhere else yeah, completely. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I know you love the baking, so I, oh, I know yeah. just the bakery that we need to go to. We need to go check that place out. Is it far? Not that far, it's right up the road. All right, buddy, let's go. 
I never expected my first visit to a Cuban bakery to be in Miami. El Brasso Fuerte has been owned and run by the same family for three generations. And the baking looks colorful. This is a big bakery, actually. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on. But for me, I like to find something that is traditional to the area, something that you would come right. and check out. So the pastelito de guayaba is something you have to have at every Cuban bakery. And right. the rest of the country, donuts and coffee for breakfast, we have pastelito de guayaba and cafecito. And so that's this one right here with the bright guava in there. Oh, wow, yeah. And what would you call this again? It, pastelito. Pastelito? Yep. OK. Junior is the man in charge of this family bakery. Right. We uh, have a secret family recipe. Oh, wow, yeah. The guava is very sweet. Almost strawberry. Sandwiched in between puff pastry. The flavor is intense. It's still warm. It melts in the mouth. It's delicious. That, that's, that's spot on there. This is, this is our stuff, man. Do you know what? As, a, as an Englishman, I'd have that with a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're the expert here. Which one would you go for? I would recommend the cream cheese. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you why. We have a little secret we do in our family. And when we actually roll out the dough that we're going to use to make the pastry, we put flour on the table, but for the cream cheese, we also like to put a little sugar. So, right. when we, so when we lay it out and we stretch it out, the sugar goes in there, and when you bake it, it gives it that nice crunchy feel. So it's not like our other pastries. That is very different. It's, it's very a bit different. like, a, I suppose, a bit like a croissant. Like a, a similar a, shape. Similar shape. Yeah. It's got the fold. Yeah, it has. Oh, wow. Do you know what that reminds me of? Because of the sugar on it and the bake, it's a bit, it tastes a bit like candy floss. That's delicious. That's, yeah, I get you on that one. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I like that a lot. This is unfussy, delicious baking. All the pastelitos are quite sweet, even the meat fillings, but Cubans clearly know their bakes. Do you make your own puff pastry? Yes, sir. We have a full production in the back if you would like to see how we do it. Do you know what? I'd love to see how you make it, yeah. yeah. The kitchen is right behind the shop. And Junior wants to show me the first bake I tried, pastelito de guava. This is where all the magic happens. This is what the bottom of our puff pastry looks like. Next step is we're going to pipe some guava onto the tray. OK. That's a lumpy bag, isn't it? This is a big bag, yes, sir. It's a big bag. I've never used guava jam, but clearly Cubans like a lot of it in their baking. Now, the trick here, when you're gonna put the top part, is to make sure you don't stretch it. Because if you yeah. stretch it, when you cook the pastry, it's gonna shrink. Yeah. So we're just gonna lay it, lift up, let it fall down on its own weight. I love Junie's ingenious homemade cutter to get the right size. And it gives us our shape. And that's it. His family make 12,000 of these pastelitos every week. Your grandfather was the one that set himself up in a bakery down here. My grandfather started the bakery. My dad was about 11, 12 years old. So my grandfather taught my dad how to do everything. I've been here since I was five, six years old helping out. So everything's been passed down generation to generation. I actually relate to that because my dad was a baker. So when I was a little boy, my dad had a chain of bakery. So when I was a kid, on a Saturday, I'd go and work, earn a bit of money. And now my son's growing up. I don't want him to be a baker. It's too, it's too hard. It's really difficult. You sound like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Junior and the rest of the family do in there is fantastic. First of all, they're keeping the family tradition alive, which to me is a big thing. I know because I come from a family of bakers. They're in a neighborhood which is predominantly Cuban. So what they're doing is keeping alive the Cuban flavors. That, for me, represents Miami. And I absolutely love it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Julia. You. Thank you, you Paul. It was a pleasure. Thanks Thank you for guys stopping by. Next, I enjoy the very best that Miami has to offer. Opulence and beauty all wrapped together in one little bubble. From the place to stay to the place to play. Nothing screams American football like the American football cheerleaders. In my quest to uncover the baking of cities all over the world, I'm exploring Miami in Florida. This place is buzzing. 
the amount of people, the music, the sounds, the lights, the smells, the food. I want to venture beyond the tourist trail, so I'm heading just north of Miami Beach, where 65,000 people are all coming here. The local Miami Dolphins are playing the Baltimore Ravens, and this is my first taste of an American football game. I think my shoulders are bigger than his. The atmosphere is incredible. Yeah, baby! And I'm hoping to experience a game day food custom. In the UK, you go and watch a sports event, you go to the pub, have something to drink, have something to eat, and go straight to the stadium. Here, it's a real family day out, I love that. The locals do something called tailgating. Tell me, what is tailgating? Tailgating is family, friends, loved ones. You get together, come to the game. It's kind of a pre-game party before the dolphin game. And the best thing is, there's great food involved. OK, so what have we got? All right, this is the grill we've got going right now. We've got pork ribs, we've got bison burgers. We're doing some clams and a wine and garlic sauce. Yeah. This is a special uh, beer, uh, cheese. beer cheese batter. I've just got to try this. Love it. That's delicious. It's really good. It really works, actually, the beer. It's got that sharpness to it, which, again, carries through with the flavour of the meat as well. And this is just the car park. I'm told the food inside the stadium is even better. This is the restaurant where all the VIPs eat before they go in the match. This place is only open on game days, but it's no hot dog stand. It's quite a big place, this. What have they got? Fresh sourdough bread. Is it? It's sourdough pizza dough, man. Can I try a piece? Of course. I've been making that sourdough for like four months. It definitely doesn't taste like regular pizza dough, I'm sure. It's chewier. It's, it's nice, got more right? of a kick to it, you know? Yeah, that's Excellent, really Excellent, nice. man. Glad you enjoy it, brother. Now, seafood, obviously. Huge amounts of prawns, crab, shrimp. The crab meat looks unbelievable. Chef in charge Mark Spooner feeds 8,000 people here before every game. Hello. Hello, Chef Mark. You're the chef. Nice to meet you, Chef. Nice to meet you. With as much local Florida produce as possible. We're featuring a, a Florida citrus salad with Florida avocado, with Florida hearts of palm, with Florida key lime. So this whole section right here is really kind of about the, the essence of where we're at. Chef Mark has laid on quite a spread here. And there's something else that's caught my eye that is very much the essence of Florida. Nothing screams American football like the American football cheerleaders. If they had cheerleaders at Liverpool, I'd probably go there more often. I'll get out your way. There may be a big game going on, but the party vibe of Miami extends even to here. Yeah! I'm starting to feel like I'm fitting in. But I can't stay here all day. While I'm in Miami, I want to head across town to an area called Coral Gables to visit one of the world's most iconic hotels. I've seen pictures of it, but I've never actually seen it in real life. Look at that. That's a hotel. That's impressive, isn't it? In its 1930s heyday, the 400-room Biltmore Hotel was the most fashionable resort in America. I can't wait to see inside. Hello. Ginger Rogers, Judy Garland and Bing Crosby all stayed here. And when it was built, it had for a long time the world's largest swimming pool. Opulence and beauty all wrapped together in one little bubble. But I'm here to meet the Biltmore's historian, Candy. Hello. Hi, how are you, Paul? I'm good. <laughs> because 1920s Miami had a dark underbelly that I'm fascinated by. Okay, we had a lot of famous actors and actresses that used to come here yeah. um, in the early 20s. And then, of course, we had very famous mobsters that would come here and also dine because it was the place to be. And, of course, it was during Prohibition, and I think they were able to drink here. Ah, <laughs> so, that, well, that makes sense. A lot of things. So when that... you're talking about the mobsters, which, which mobsters specifically are you talking about? Well, we had Al Capone um, would come here to dine, but one of his colleagues or cohorts um, held a illegal gambling facility up on the 13th floor. His name was Thomas Fatty Walsh. Wow. Fatty's gambling den still exists on the 13th floor, although it's now the hotel's most expensive suite. 
this is where Fatty stayed. And I believe the rumor has it that he got into an argument with another mobster right. who then came up and shot uh, both he and his bodyguard and the bullets remain in the fireplace. Is that it there? Yes, that's uh, the bullets. <laughs> wow. One of America's most notorious mobsters met his end right here. What the hell there? Yes. Wow. So ultimately, this place not only has a colourful ceiling, has a colourful history too. A very colourful history. Wow. Thankfully, there are other things that keep today's visitors coming back to Biltmore. Down in the kitchens, I'm meeting executive chef David Hackett. Hello, chef. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Welcome nice to the Biltmore main kitchen. Great kitchen. I yeah. love the building upstairs, but the heart of the operation is always in here. I was head baker at London's Dorchester Hotel, so I feel right at home here. So this is the this is the bakery. Not very big, as you can see. The guys come in at 4 o'clock, just like most bakeries, and certainly the first one's in the kitchen, and they start production. I'm hoping to sniff out some of David's more unusual breads. Can you tell what that is? It's quite sharp. It's like wine. Correct, yeah, it's a, is it? a red wine reduction in shallots. <laughs> you got a good nose. Well, this looks like an uncut a baguette. Yeah, that's a very unique bread. It's very, I guess, would you say, common to South Florida. Really? Yeah, that is a uh, one of our Cuban breads. Now, the Cuban bread is very similar to a French baguette, but the thing that makes the Cuban bread so unique is it's all-purpose flour versus high-gluten flour, and we also use lard or shortening in the dough itself. All-purpose flour is more like a cake flour, isn't it, than, right. uh, than a bread flour? Yeah, well, it's got ha yeah, half cake and uh, half you, bread. You can tell straight away. Yeah, it's a little more... This bread is uniquely adapted to work with the high humidity and temperatures of Cuba and Miami. So obviously, the temperature and humidity in Miami must be a problem to breads. It's a humid climate oh, down Oh, absolutely, here. yeah. The crusty breads kind of get tougher. Mm, this thing will last a little bit longer than it that. It will. So you're deliberately making it quite tight. And again, the lard will hold the moisture as well. Exactly. That's nice. That'd Thank be great you. for sandwiches. Oh, it's fantastic with sandwiches. I've never heard of a Cuban bread before. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a hybrid. Yeah, you know, a hybrid. Right? I like it. Nice. Before I leave Miami, I want to mark my visit with a bake of my own. And what better than a dessert that characterizes the Florida sunshine? Key lime pie. Thank you very much indeed, Chef. All right, holler if you need anything, it. Chef. Thank you, thank you. Now, obviously, the key thing in a key lime pie is limes. Now, this is a key lime. It's more of a shine to it than a conventional sort of Persian style lime. Let me show you. That is the traditional Persian lime, as you'd know in the UK. That's a key lime. This is much sweeter, that's much tartar. That's what makes the key lime pie in Florida, in Miami, the best. In Miami, the base is crumb graham crackers, but I use digestives in the UK. Into which, I'm gonna add some softened melted butter. A foil dish will help you turn it out easily later. And then begin to flatten it all down. Get your foil in there and just press it down. Let's have a quick look at that. It's coming together quite nicely. The juice of 12 key limes is about the same as four normal limes. And the big ones are much easier to zest. Lime is one of those flavors that just floats my boat. Big style. Really don't go under on the lime. You want that flavor, you want that zest, you want that zing. When you hit your mouth, you go, oh, and then the sweetness hits. Because what I'm gonna add to this now is condensed milk. So I've got four egg yolks, which are gonna go straight in the bowl. It's beginning to thicken already, actually. That's the sort of consistency you're looking for. It drops easily off the, off the balloon whisk. Drop that into the base. Now what I need to do is bake that off. It bakes in a moderate oven for about 25 minutes. And that's it. That's how you make a key lime pie. When it's cool, decorate with some fresh cream piped on top. Now, is my recipe as good as the Miami original? David has offered to give it a taste test. There you go, chef. Oh, fantastic. I hope you enjoy it. It's beautiful. It's a little celebration of uh, limes. Oh, fantastic. It's nice and sharp. Do you like it, though? Oh, it's excellent. 
Thank you very much for today, Chef. Oh, it's our pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for the pie. Glad you like it. <laughs> One of my favorite ever pies. What a great way to end my visit to Miami. Thank you very much indeed. I asked actually for an orange juice. I think there might be orange juice in there. What my time in Miami has shown me is a city of two sides. What you'll find in Miami is obviously the tourist places, like Miami Beach, for instance, Ocean Drive with all the drinks and its vibrancy and its hype. America's original party town is as good for eating in today as it was in the 1920s. But then you've got Little Havana. Cuba is obviously just off the coast and the influences of the food is all around us. This makes it a city that is different on so many levels. It's fascinating to explore, and I will definitely be back. If you go into a bar and ask for an orange juice and end up with that, you know you're in somewhere pretty special. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. Bellissimo. In search of the people, the places, and the traditions that make the very best of baking. Oh. From the laid-back sunshine vibe of Miami <coughs> to the European chic of Paris. Oh, superb. This time on City Bakes, I'm in the Bavarian region of Germany, in the city of Munich. So what do you think of when you think of Munich? Rye bread, pretzels, lederhosen, beer. It's a beautiful city, situated in Bavaria. As with most European cities, this is a major tourist destination. But I want to go beyond that. I want to check out the baking culture on the back streets. What do the people of Munich actually eat? There seem to be bakeries all over Munich. And I want to visit as many as I can. Look at that. Al Safran, it's called. I've never seen one before. Nuts, puff pastry, creme pat. Simple, that's delicious. Welcome to Munich. Exploring this city is easy. It's quite compact and perfect for strolling. I live in a small village in Kent. And actually, the church is across the road, and every Sunday we get woken up by the bell ringers, which is actually quite cute. But in Munich, bells seem to go off all the time. They celebrate bells. Even the town hall tower has 43 bells in it that entertain the crowd at 11 a.m. every day. This is one of the few things I remember from my first visit to Munich when I was just 16. My dad said, let's I want to take you to a bakery exhibition. It was my real first foray into the baking world. He said, you need to get smartened up. So we went out and bought me a suit, a sandy colored suit with a waistcoat with sandy shoes. <laughs> I'm sure no one recognizes me. Munich is what you call a foodie city. Amazing. The people here seem to make time to enjoy the good things in life. That's more like it, the German sausage. This is Munich's food market, central part of Munich. This is not necessarily a tourist area, but this is where the people of Munich come to buy their food. Like old markets should be, this appears to be the city's meeting place for a lunch in the sunshine with friends. I could explore all day, but I've arranged to meet a friend. Hi, Falco. Hey, Paul, nice, nice to, see, to see you again, and welcome to Germany. Falco Birkett is going to show me around the baking of Munich. Falco trained in Stuttgart and actually owns a chain of bakeries in Scotland. What he doesn't know about German baking, he could fit on a postage stamp. Falco has promised to show me parts of Munich baking I would never find on my own. And his first stop is a donut shop. The donut. I didn't know that the Germans were famous for making donuts. Which is, is strange. I know, you wouldn't think like that, but shall we go and try it? Let's go try it, yeah. Andreas is a donut maker, and his family business has been going here since 1973. And it's a favorite pit stop for locals. We call it Schmalzl, 
It's kind of a Munich breakfast, you know. You should try. Yeah, I will, yeah. actually. <laughs> I mean, you can see how thin that is. It's, it is like a ring donut, but it's still got a bit of skin on the bottom. Yeah. In, in Munich, they call it as well pulled out one. Mm. As you can see how he's doing it, he just pulls the dough out and drops it in. Mm. But taste-wise, what do you think? It's quite um, a light batter, actually. Mm. It does taste very, very good. Andreas makes several shapes of donuts. This one is called a stritzel. It takes me back to when I was a kid going to the carnival, the fairground. Yeah. A fresh donut and you're going on all the rides. That's what they yeah. use here at Carnival as well. Traditionally, end of the year, like we call it Sylvester, you call it New Year's Eve. Mm. And then on Carnival, before Lent starts, this is traditionally eaten as well. Lovely. A good donut is something that's very difficult to beat. Delicious, absolutely delicious. Fired up by deep fried dough and sugar, and just as well as the weather in Munich can turn fast, I'm ready for Falco's next treat. So tell me about this place we're going to visit. The next one is the Café Kreuzkamm. It's one of the oldest Kontisai places here in Munich, but it's the high end. I'm looking forward to this then. <laughs> <laughs> A Konditerei Café is something uniquely German. So what are we looking at here? So this is the proper Konditerei all high quality products. So what is that? Is that a cake guy, a pastry guy? You would call it a pastry chef. Yeah. In, in Germany, it's called a conditor, and a conditorei is the shop where the conditormeister works in. Okay. Let's go in. The conditor who baked these cakes would have trained for eight years to qualify as a conditormeister, just like my friend Falco. So he knows what to look out for. It's all regulated. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Prince Regenten torte is a speciality from Munich. Yes. It has to have seven layers. It has to yeah. be precision. It's like with the cars, but should look as the same as possible. If you didn't follow the rules and decided to do your own thing, what would have been the punishment? I mean, it's down how heavy you mistreat the law. I mean, in the old days, you got jailed. Well, These days, uh, you just end up in front of a court and Possibly your place will be shut down. <laughs> Jailed for making a cake wrong. Imagine. This Prince Regent Torta has been made exactly like this for probably a century. It's so neat. That is what makes a Konditermeister. This is the art to do it proper. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, let's try it. Each layer is baked individually, mathematically measured out so they are precisely the same depth. The flavors coming through are delicious, actually. Um, the buttercream, it's got a slight nutty flavour in there as well. Yes. Actually, I'd have that with a cup of tea any day. Any day. The next cake is a Kreuzerkamm torta. That looks amazing, there. That? It's quite thick layers there, isn't it? Yes. Fruity. Apricot? Mmm. It's tart, but it's, it's delicious. The final cake is like nothing I've seen before. It's sliced sideways. How do you eat this? Just pick it up with your fingers or something? No, uh, so that's the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> Never had that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and see the layers. All of it. You can see individually the layers going all the way up. They're so thick. This is a Baumkuchen, which translates as tree cake because of its rings. What's in this? The easiest to explain is like a heavy sponge mix. Mm hmm It is nice. Not as soft as a traditional, say, Victoria sandwich, for instance. Baumkochen was invented about four, five hundred years ago. Wow. And it was made really popular with the last Kaiser because he wanted a Baumkuchen in every city he's going to visit. This was his favourite cake. It's so neat. It's so elegant. It's so German. <laughs> It's hard to imagine how Konditermeisters achieve a round cake that's baked with layers so dense and so thin. But, of course, Falco has the answer. Café Kreuzkamm's bakery is testament to just how popular these cakes are in Germany. It's a Konditerei factory and they ship their cakes as far away as Japan. And there they are, rolls and rolls of Baumkuchen gently cooling. These are probably the strangest cakes I've ever seen. They're impressive, aren't they? Yeah. And still all handmade. And they're all perfect. That is the Konditermeister coming through again. And the boss is Konditermeister Frank. Good morning. Hi. My name is Frank. Hi. And I can't wait to try and make one myself. 
So can you take us through the process? Where does it all start? The dough is made with fresh ingredients. You have an open fire with gas and you bake it layer by layer. I've never seen anything like this before. The cake batter coats the horizontal spits and they slowly rotate as the batter is cooked by grills at the back. It's strangely similar to a kebab machine laid on its side. It's fascinating to watch. Thankfully, I'm not on the eight cake machine, but a single bound cooker machine at the back. So what is this mix? You've got flour, eggs. Marzipan, almonds, sugar, spices, yeah, that's the main. So the only rising agent in it is the egg? Yeah. yeah. By law, you're not allowed to add baking powder. OK. That's one of these things we were Otherwise, you could be jailed. <laughs> Condita Meister's law. <laughs> As each layer roasts, it caramelizes, like the outside of any normal cake. This gives the Baumkuchen its intense flavor right through it. It's such a strange cake to make. I mean, the idea is really strange. Fridge, yeah. What I'm trying to figure out, you know the rolls that you do, and it yeah. sort of goes like this, how do you do that? That's we see in the next steps. You want to have a go? Yeah. You basically line it and then press it on. There? Yeah, and hold it in an angle. Yeah, that's it. That's it, just dip it so the drips are all coming off. Pull it towards you and strip it off. Perfect. After baking, they are cooled before being cut and glazed in a variety of ways. It's beautiful. Perfect German precision in a 500-year-old cake. A fitting end to my first day in Munich. We're going to have to try and take one of these home with me. <laughs> How am I going to get that on the plane? <laughs> Next, well, I get a taste of good old-fashioned Bavarian hospitality. I'm sent round the twist, baking a local delicacy. I don't get it. <laughs> and I take inspiration from this warm-hearted city to create a Dampfnudel, a delicious Munich pudding that is great baked at home. My adventures around the world's best baking cities has brought me to Munich in Germany. It's a city with a gentle, almost village-like feel where the only high rises are the church spires and this, the tower on the magnificent town hall. Love the door. And I've been allowed up to get a view over the rooftops. Now we've got to go up to the top and this is a very tight staircase. Here we go. Wow, come with me. Oh dear, wow, what a view. That is incredible. It's, it's the center of Munich. It's amazing. Although much of Munich was flattened in World War II, it's since been faithfully rebuilt. So today, I really feel like I'm looking back in time. That looks quite new, actually, that bit of Munich. As you pan around, you see the old bit. But what gets me is this view here. Panoramic view of the Alps all the way along. That is beautiful. I've got to take a photo. Selfie on top of tower in München. You can see in the distance the Alps. Great selfie. I know there's more baking to explore down at street level. German bread is famous around the world, and I can't wait to try some. Thank you. This bakery, just off the market, has been owned by the same Munich family for five generations, and everything is baked locally. So we've got three distinctive breads here. The first one, soft, very vanilla-y, very brioche-like. This is Richard Stritzel, a really old Bavarian recipe, baked here for four generations. The almonds on it really take off. It's a nice loaf. It's a very, very good loaf. This is fascinating. It's like dried flowers or fresh herbs on the top of that one as well. I've never seen dried petals on bread like this before, but this is a Blutenkruste, a new Bavarian bread. It was created for a flower festival just 10 years ago. Great flavour to it. Nice look, though, but it's the seeds inside that the, that the, that's the winner. You can see the seeds there. See? That's a bit of roughage right there. Keep you regular. This is Wurlieb, a traditional taste of Bavaria, a rye sourdough. That's a tough old loaf, that one. Perfect, though. It's delicately spiced with fennel, 
caraway, coriander and star anise. So that's quite an intense flavour. Again, strong, sour in there, stone baked, heavy crust. That's what I expected to see when I came to Munich. And as if on cue... Bells, the bells. Yeah, let's have another one join us as well, shall we? We need a third, we need a third. There we go, there's a third one joining us. Isn't that marvellous? <laughs> they're celebrating the bread, that's what they're doing, they're celebrating the bread. I'm meeting up again with my friend Falco. He's invited me out for a beer to one of the most famous of all the beer halls in Munich. Under a magnificent vaulted ceiling, an umpar band players beer is drunk by the litre. I love it. Isn't that just brilliant? Why can't we have that at every pub in Britain? I love that. Now, I know this is where they do the big pints, the big litres. The mass, yeah. OK, we need to get a oh, table. Let's just try it. I love it. The beer houses, they used to be always in cellars. But this one here, because it's an ex-supplier to the king, had a purpose-built building for that. Beer is delivered here, not in barrels, but by the tanker load, and it's served by the stein. Thank you. Thank you. Prost. <laughs> yeah, I think I could stay here all day. Beer halls in Bavaria are not just about getting drunk. Germans like to eat and get drunk. Pretzels have been baked in Bavaria since the 12th century, and they have to be sold fresh and salty. These things, globally, are so popular. Yeah. How much more Bavarian do you want me to get? A pretzel and a beer. And if you're still peckish, big chunks of meat and huge sausages are the staple. Nothing subtle about this cuisine. But there's a pudding on the menu that's caught my eye. Dankeschön. It's like something I used to have at school dinners. Wait till you try that. This is what is known it's a damp noodle. It's a comfort food idea. It is, big style. Well, it's warm, it's fat, it's fluffy. Yeah, it tastes good. What you've got there is a steamed dough. It's a plain, basic dough. It's great. It's comfort food. Move me beer in Bavaria with me mate. <laughs> it's all good. Brosch. 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 <laughs> yeah. The pretzels on sale here are bigger and fresher than I've ever seen before. You buy them by stopping one of the sellers. How many of these would you sell in a day? It can be on the day to 200, 230. 230 is an impressive amount. Falco tells me that Munich's pretzels have a secret. They are nearly all made by a hidden bakery that supplies most of the beer houses. This needs investigating. OK, I'm looking for the bakery, Matthews. It's Matthews Bakery, Landstraff. I'm on the right road. Number four. There's no bakery in sight. Hello. Yes, but deep underground, I enter Pretzel World. It's like being in the cabin with the Beatles. Uwe and his team make nothing but pretzels here. 6,000 small ones and 1,000 large pretzels on an average day. They promise Munich's beer halls that when an order is phoned through, fresh pretzels will be delivered within two hours. This is going to be interesting. I need to have a go at this. They're made with a deft flick of the wrist. No, sir. And apparently, a bear hook. OK. Yeah. Ah, uh, OK. OK, so that's how pretzels are made. <laughs> These guys make theirs in eight seconds. How the hell is that happening? Please don't start timing me. I don't get it. <laughs> how the hell? <laughs> it's not doing anything. It's like witchcraft. Oh, this is winding me up. I like to be good at stuff straight away, and I'm just not. Maybe my baking skills can be best used elsewhere. To achieve the pretzel's rich colour, they are dipped in a caustic drain cleaner. It's an alkaline solution known as lye. Thankfully, 
it is harmless after it's baked. Now, to get the same effect at home, what you can use is bicarbonate and water. It's coated in the film. After a large sprinkle of salt, the pretzels are now ready for the oven. The colour on them are incredible. That beautiful, rich colour coming from the alkali. Wunderbar. Merci. Thank you, Sean. That is how you make a proper pretzel. Delicious. Before I leave Munich, I want to create my own city bake, inspired by something I've experienced, but with my own Hollywood twist. And I know just the thing. Having spoken to Falco, I can dig to Meister, and we've decided to make a damp noodle. This is the pudding we enjoyed in the beer hall, but I want to make mine with a fruity surprise inside. Thanks for the hat, by the way. Let me just correct this. You have to do it a bit proper. There you go. What, on the side? Yeah, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> OK, fair enough. Uh, to make a damp noodle, we need a basic dough. Is there any chance you can warm that up for me and I'll put that in the yeah, dough? Yeah, quickly go to the kitchen. Fantastic. Starting with melted butter and warm milk. Stop laughing at my hat. Now, what I'm going to do in this bowl is put some flour. We need some dried yeast and one oh. egg. And then we need to add a little bit of salt. There you go. Ah, perfect. OK, the next thing I'm going to add is some sugar. Have you made the damp noodle before? Oh, God. Yeah, it's, it's a childhood thing. You learn it as the first thing with your mother normally at home. <laughs> <laughs> Falco's warm milk and butter will bring everything together to form a nice soft dough. Pop that back in there. This needs to rise for an hour or so. So this is the dough. What I'm going to do is just divide this into six pieces. Damp noodle are usually plain, but I want mine to have a Hollywood twist. Now, these are black Morello cherries. This sauce has been reduced, so it's a little thicker than normal. What I'm going to do is put about three cherries into each ball. To cook them, I'm going to follow the method Falco grew up with. You see that simple? A bit butter. Mm -hmm. Now we need a bit salt and a bit sugar. Is that all right? All right, it's fine. Okay. A little bit of salt. On top of the butter, salt and sugar go the damp noodles. So you end up with all the rolls in there. So pour about a centimetre maximum of water in, which will create, when it's cooking, steam. After a short prove, these go onto a moderate stove top. The water will evaporate and then the butter will crisp in the base. That's it. That's all we need to do. That will be steamed now for about 15, 20 minutes. We're going to have a little custard with it. And it should be absolutely delicious. I really like it, and I like the cherries too. Mm -hmm. It gives a bit more interest. It does. I really enjoy that. My first Dampflugel. Dampfnudel. Post. <laughs> <laughs> What a comforting way to end my visit to Munich. I think it's an amazing city, culturally. I think it's one of those cities that you just have to visit. It's that precision, not just in German engineering, which is so famous, but it's in their baking too. The Italians bake from the heart, the passione, the Germans, have two things. They do have the passion and they do have the precision. And you know what? I've loved Munich. I've loved the people. I've loved the food and I've loved the place. And I will definitely be coming back.